I work for a well-known university as a field biologist, and I've recently been contracted out to the National Forest Service. My first assignment has been in the Potomac District of the Monongahela National Forest. Basically, I receive GPS coordinates, and I either drive or hike to the designated spot and do what they want me to do. This could be setting up trail cameras and or counters, monitoring equipment, trail surveys, and the like and then recording the data 24 hours after placement. No big deal. I thought it odd that they specifically requested I place the cameras only three feet off the ground, and some of the infrared cameras in the trees at specified heights. Some of these locations are on designated trails, but some are way off the trail in places that humans would never go. Sometimes there isn't a hotel or lodging close enough and the Forest Service has outfitted me in some pretty dank camping gear on occasions I might have to camp. I am an experienced hiker and camper, and I've spent many nights out in the field due to my career choice. I'm a woman, about 5 foot 6 and 130 pounds, but I'm not really afraid of anything. Again, the Forest Service has outfitted me well, and I wear an emergency beacon that will send every law enforcement officer into the area of my location in no time. So I've been assigned to this district for a few months now, and I've really enjoyed my work. West Virginia is very remote and unspoiled, and that's why I do what I do. I get to see things most people wouldn't, and I've had so many positive and almost spiritual moments. Up until a few nights ago. I was working up near Spruce Knob, which is the highest point in West Virginia, and a complex system of trails wilderness areas, camping, and that kind of thing. It has also been snowing with howling winds and ice storms. I was camping up there to complete my work, and while the conditions were rough, I was almost enjoying it. My first night in the woods was pretty peaceful. I made dinner, set up camp and drank some whiskey, and had a really good smoke. I snuggled down in my sleeping bag and slept like a rock. It was very cold but I wear this turtle fur face mask thing and didn't feel the cold too much. I woke up at dawn and went about building my fire back up and starting some coffee when I noticed all this churned up snow around my campsite. It wasn't tracks, just churned up snow like someone or something had kicked it all around. Weird, but whatever. I had a 15 mile hike to set some cameras and didn't have time to really wander about. I set off on my hike, did what I had to do, and started back to camp. I never wear earbuds or anything, because hearing is one of the most important senses in the wilderness. I want to be able to hear any animals or people before I see them. It was already past dark when I made it back to the camp. I was too tired to do anything except strip down to my base layer, get in my sleeping bag, and pass out. At around 2 a.m., I woke up because I could hear people talking. People. I was about 30 miles up a gravel road that was locked with forest service gates and about 10 miles from where my truck was parked and I could hear voices. I completely lost my shit. I have a firearm and I quietly retrieved it from my backpack and then got back into my sleeping bag and cocked it and waited. I was on high alert all of my senses going wild. Eventually the voices faded and I couldn't hear them anymore, but I never went back to sleep. At daylight, I emerged from my tent to more churned up snow and my two trail cameras hanging from a tree about five foot from my tent. Cameras I placed 15 miles out from my campsite. I packed my shit as fast as I could and hauled ass back to my truck. Along the way, I saw a lot of human boot tracks all around my side, and when I reached my truck, I discovered it had been broken into. My computer and my other equipment had been stolen. I'm currently in a luxury log cabin at some resort, too scared to retrieve my other equipment, and too embarrassed to tell my superiors about how scared I am. The forest service got me a new truck while my other one's getting the window replaced. I did make a report about the theft but there is no way in hell I'm ever going back to that site. I don't know if this means I'll be fired or sent to work at a desk, 
but out of all the years I've been doing this in national forests around the country, this is the most terrified I've ever been. I'm not scared of the animals, and I have many stories to share about my encounters with them. I am scared of the people. I'm a wilderness survival instructor and security contractor. A couple of days ago, a student of mine and good friend, who I'd taken out into the woods before, told me his dad just got 150 acres of land in a secluded, mountainous part of my state. It had a large amount of forest on it that hadn't been explored yet, as his dad was only building something for his horses that took up about 100 yards of the property. His horses were free to roam at that moment. He said his dad got an insane deal on the property. My friend is now a dad of three, and I know he doesn't get out into the woods that often, so I agreed to go with him because it seemed really fun, and I can imagine he needs a getaway every now and then. We are both indigenous, into cars, into wilderness survival and all sorts of stuff, so we never run out of anything to talk about in the woods. His dad, however, told us that he didn't want anybody exploring the woods unless we had a gun. He said it was because he saw coyotes. Now we're all indigenous here. We were raised in the same state. Coyotes don't actually attack people, really. My friend RC also told me a while back when he was first at the property, he saw movement in the tree lines that was roughly human-sized in shape, but he really couldn't tell since his eyesight isn't that good. I brought my AR and small flint napping kit just for the fun of it, and we set off onto the property. We explored a lot of the rolling fields, creeks, multiple natural springs and ponds. Everything felt normal. It was a beautiful landscape. Eventually we decided to get to the forest part of the property as it hadn't been explored yet. As soon as we entered the tree line, the entire mood shifted. The forest had an ambience of its own. It was very similar to the woods in the movie, The Ritual. The woods were grey and dead silent, save for the occasional creaking of tall, tired cedar trees. There was a very small stream running through the center of it, with sand that was black. It felt like we were surrounded, watched from all sides. It didn't take very long before a very pungent stench hit our nostrils. It was the odor of rotting flesh. We decided to follow the smell and found the remains of three to four cows. We examined the exposed skulls, and we couldn't find any bullet holes. It didn't appear to me that these cows had been put down. Something killed them, though. Their bones were spread over about thirty yards. There were large indentations in the dirt all around them that were very vague in their shape. We decided to press in on the woods. Now we were accompanied only by silence, the putrid odor of death, and the sound of our own heartbeats. We kept stopping at the stream as I noticed several different types of tracks, large coyote tracks, and something else that was large but intentionally avoided the sand it seemed. We pressed on into the woods until we started to find trees that had been bent over and pinned behind other trees while they were still alive. Something that could never, ever happen naturally. We hiked on and found what I can only describe as a tool made of bone, lying on the ground. It was extremely crude but looked like some kind of scooping tool or knife. It was disturbing because although it looked primitive, it looked way more primitive than a person would make, but an intentionally shaped tool nonetheless. We hiked on until we found a clearing with a pond that had more large oval tracks surrounding it. On the other side of the pond, we found a very strange little tree structure. It was like an A-frame. It had rocks placed up against it. However, it wasn't that sturdy, and the rocks were very peculiarly placed. We found no signs of any campfires around it. We found no camping trash. This isn't exactly a place you could hike to from a house. It was getting dark, so we decided we should head back. 
I had a flashlight on my AR, but I didn't want to rely on that in the dark with something that kills cows and make tools out of their bones somewhere behind us. We made our way out of the forest and back to where the trucks were parked just in time before it got too dark to see. As we were leaving, we saw something on top of one of the hills that we couldn't identify, but we didn't stick around to find out what it was. It's worth mentioning that the previous owner began construction of something on the property. They abruptly halted construction and left. In summer of 2019, my partner and I decided to take a road trip to Vancouver, Canada and stay at the Golden Ears Provincial Park. We liked camping, had spring break, and wanted to do something different and make the most out of our vacation. My partner had never been out of the US, and it seemed like a crazy new experience. It was a six-day trip with Airbnbs in each state, and the grand finale was a reserved campsite at Golden Ears. It was close to the water, Alouette Lake. We packed terribly, had a giant tent, got a bunch of fruit and veggies to eat healthily, stored them in a cooler that was too small, and brought a cutting board and knife to break up the snacks while driving. We started in California, switched off driving our bright red Ford Fiesta. We drove through Oregon and Washington and made it to Vancouver. We spent a day or two in each state, drank a little too much and stayed out late. Canada was the best part, and Alouette Lake felt like walking in a painting. We walked barefoot on the rocks with our feet in the freezing cold lake. We hiked around, saw a beautiful waterfall where we saw a couple taking pictures of each other for an hour, and we started modeling the same poses from far away. Everything was perfect, and the campsite was empty, except for the other couple. We went to bed early that night, it was quiet, and I woke up to cackling outside the tent. My partner was still asleep and snoring. I didn't think much of it because it was pitch black and probably an animal. The cackling continued closer to the tent. I sat up and grabbed my phone. The brightness came on and I turned it off, almost blinding myself with the light. In those two seconds, I could make out a person right outside our tent. I froze and sat up. They weren't moving and were close enough to unzip the tent. I started poking my partner because I had no idea what to do. My partner woke up and I said there's someone outside the tent. And then I hear footsteps, quiet footsteps walking out of our campsite. My partner starts loudly saying, what, repeatedly in a sleepy haze. A car or truck is parked right outside our camping area. No one is near our campsite. It starts up and then drives off. They didn't turn their lights on until they turned the corner and were out of view, so I couldn't make out much, but it looked like a truck. I was shaking and my partner couldn't put together what was happening. I wanted to leave, but Golden Ears locks the gate until 6 or 7 a.m. The time was 1 a.m., so we had to stay there. I make us move to the Ford Fiesta and sleep in a tightly packed car. My fiancé falls asleep immediately and thinks I'm paranoid. Could it have been a park ranger, I thought. It seemed too weird of a behavior for a park ranger. I sit there wide awake for about two hours. The car is locked and I want to sleep, but I can't. I'm in the passenger seat, my partner in the driver's seat asleep, and it's 3 a.m. I'm sitting half awake. I hear a car slowly driving up the road lights off as it rounds the corner. It had to be the same truck, and I was scared, but my adrenaline was pumping. It slowly rounds the corner and pulls up directly in front of our campsite, again, in the same spot. I felt like I was going to throw up. I had no weapon but the kitchen knife we bought for the fruit and vegetables, so I grabbed the knife and tried to make myself look angry, crazy, and big. I sit straight up in the passenger seat, holding the kitchen knife. I keep it straight up at eye level, 
and stare deadpan out at this truck in the pitch black, just like the father in the American Gothic painting. The truck stops and turns off. A light shines directly into my face, coming from inside the truck, and I stare back, terrified, in my bright red Ford Fiesta, holding my large kitchen knife, not blinking. The truck starts up and turns on its lights, and they stay on, blinding me, and the truck pulls out and turns around and goes back the way it came. My heart was pounding. I wake up my partner and say we need to get the hell out of there. We pack by just throwing things into our car and sit there awake until 6am. We drive home and don't stop. We keep rehashing and trying to make sense of the situation. We ultimately decide that we both need sleep. This event occurred in early fall 1971 or 1972. I'm not sure what jogged this memory, but it is probably something to do with Reddit's off-the-grid weirdness. Also, some of the details are a bit grey, but the gist of the story begins here. I grew up in the Philly suburbs. The Boy Scouts were popular then, and I was quite active, especially with camping. One of the go-to areas was the New Jersey Pine Barrens, especially along the Wading River and Bass River State Forest. And now on to the man. Our patrol was on a weekend camping trip at the South Shore Campground. Lots of pine breaks, but even more swamps. And bogs. And boggy swamps. Our patrol, probably seven of us plus one guy's dad who drove us, was assigned to a three-sided shelter. The front of the shelter opened to the swamp. If you walked 11 feet from the front of the shelter, you'd be standing in ankle-deep water. And then it just goes deeper and darker and boggier. We muck about Saturday morning until late afternoon, made our way back to the shelter, cooked dinner, and chilled until it got dark. It was crazy dark. No other campers around. Just the light of our slowly dying fire. We began to hear a splashing sound coming from the swamp maybe a hundred feet out from the fire. One of the guys yelled something toward the sound, and everything went quiet. A minute later, the splashing began again, but slower and methodical. By this time, it was within fifteen feet of the fire, but still out of the fire's light. Here's what our vibe was. None of us were concerned. We were all seasoned campers and figured it was a deer or raccoon looking to score an easy meal. Suddenly the walking became a slow, steady sloshing. This parked us up, wondering if this thing may suddenly decide to rush us. Our patrol leader jumped up, grabbed his flashlight, and pointed it toward the noise. His light hit something. He yelled, It's a man, and ran to the swamp burn. I saw a brief flash of red flannel in the flashlight beam, then heard fast splashing back into the swamp. The splashing eventually faded out into the darkness. So, what did we do? Tried to figure out what the hell just happened, then crawled into our sleeping bags and fell asleep. Nothing else happened and we went back home the next day as scheduled. Thinking back on it now, it must have been a local, piney, who knew the area well? The man had to navigate through some serious and dangerous swamps to check us out. The pines have great and eerie vibes, and that weekend held both. I was hunting for black bear one day, back in the early 2000s. The area I was hunting in was northern Clinton County. My ex-brother-in-law and I enjoyed the area and spent many a season scouting and hunting these lands. This part of the country is filled with long hollows, steep inclines, and hard-to-access trails. 
We both like to do our own thing and hunt separate terrains. I would often dive down into the hollows, while he scoured the ridge lines, hoping to get a shot at whatever I pushed over the tops. We both carried pretty bumped up two-way radios to keep a general idea where we were, although the terrain made it too difficult for good reception. This was a typical Pennsylvania bear season day. It was on the Wednesday of the season, third and last day of the brief season it was back then. The woods were quiet with no distant whooping and yodeling of various open day camps pushing drives through the woods. The weather was cold, gray, and windy when we separated to begin our hunt and continued on throughout the day. I spent the day still hunting down this long hollow south of a little town in north central Clinton County with the idea of meeting my brother-in-law at the top of a ridge at an agreed time of 4 p.m giving us plenty of time to hike together the few miles back to his truck. After hunting all day, I found an old game trail that appeared to meander its way back up to the ridge line towards where I knew he would be waiting for me. After close to an hour, maybe around 3.30, I made my way two-thirds of the way to the top, stopping often, scoping the slope for that jet-black fur of a roaming bear. Along the trail, I came upon a long ago used fire ring. It was very rudimentary in its build and appeared to be used only once. The ring's rocks were covered in lichen and only had the faintest of traces of black from a fire long ago. I found it odd that a fire ring would be here, considering the steepness of the slope, but it was a very small, somewhat leveled ledge. There I figured I would sit and eat the rest of my packed food and sit still hoping to catch a final chance to see a bear. All the while, it felt odd, somewhat unwelcoming, like I shouldn't be there. It almost felt like I was a forbidden interloper on someone's valued spot. I sat for maybe 20 minutes and thought it was time to continue the trek upward to my butt. As I stood, I slung my backpack on and reached down to sling my rifle over my left shoulder. As I stood up, I heard my name called loudly. It didn't really sound like it was behind me, but rather all around in my head. Just as I was going to turn around, my rifle was slapped off my shoulder. I felt the force, heard the sound of something slap against the wood of the stock, and crouched quickly to save my gun from dashing onto the rocks at my feet. I grabbed it in the nick of time and quickly turned around to see who I thought was my brother-in-law joking with me. There was nobody stood there at all. There was absolutely no way anyone had rushed off without me seeing or hearing them. I felt a sick feeling in my churning stomach, chills throughout my body. I muttered a few Hail Marys and sped up to the top of the ridge, met my butt, and quietly we hiked our way out of the woods to his truck in the spreading dark of the evening. This has bothered me for years, and I have not been back into those particular woods since. Someday, I hope to. My friend and I were hiking in Blue Ridge, Georgia. We were just going camping for one day and the trail was a part of the Appalachian Trail near the very start of it. My friend told me a story about one of his friends. He said that he heard voices and footsteps at night, near Blood Mountain. He had to night hike because the noises were so intense. So back to the main story now. We found a campsite and set up shop. As it got darker, we got a bad feeling. It felt like someone was watching us. Then it started. We saw a pair of red glowing eyes about 100 to 150 feet away from our fire. Then my friend goes to dunk his head in the creek near our tent. He claims something pushed him into the water. His shirt was soaked and he hit his nose on a rock and it was bleeding. Then after that, we heard a woman's voice. We heard it in front of us, behind us, and to the left of us over near the creek. It could have been a night hiker. But to the left, there was no trail. The night hikers weren't using a flashlight if they were there. 
We also heard footsteps around us and sticks snapping. We finally just got to the tent and tried to sleep. My friend fell asleep before me. I heard twigs snapping right next to my head outside of the tent. But that's pretty much it. It's very creepy. If you decide to go camping in Blue Ridge, just know there's things out there lurking at night. So this happened about a year ago. I liked a dog sit for my co-workers in the hospital for extra cash. One of the nurses wanted me to dog sit for her while her and her family were out of town. I had done this many times so I had no problem dog sitting alone. She lived in a very nice area of town so bad things weren't likely to happen. Or at least I thought. She told me that her husband was a police officer for the city they lived in but his guns would be locked away. She also went on to tell me that they have a security system that will record anything by all doors. She gave me the lock information if it was needed, but I insisted that I should be fine. Fast forward to me dog sitting. The first couple of nights were fairly normal. It was a big house, so it was a bit creepy feeling, but nothing I haven't dealt with before. One night, me and my boyfriend at the time were watching TV in the living room. The blinds all were open to the backyard. It was most likely around midnight since me and him both worked night schedules and we saw a flashlight through the yard. But it wasn't a car passing by because it angled down to the grass. The dog was in the kennel since he was a pup and needed to be in for sleep so the dog wouldn't have been able to go and find someone. Well, we both noticed it so we decided to go outside and check it out but no one was there, absolutely nothing or no one. So naturally we went to bed because it was now 2am. While laying in the bedroom upstairs talking, we heard a door shut from downstairs. I immediately shushed my boyfriend and said, did you hear that? Yeah, but I don't know what it was, he said. He gets up to lock the bedroom door and turn off the lights. He whispers to me, be quiet and listen. We sat up in the dark room shaking. We heard yet another door shut downstairs. He tells me, call the cops, as he grabbed a lamp at the bedside and stands by the door. As I was on the phone with the operator, she tries to calm me down, telling me officers were on their way to the scene. Then we heard the footsteps of our invader coming up the stairs where we were at. I started to cry quietly, telling the lady on the phone the person was upstairs with us now. We heard a knock at the door and footsteps going back down the stairs. I cried, telling the lady there's a knock at the door. She reassured me that it was the cops, but I had to come downstairs to let them in. I told her, you're insane. A person is in the house and you want me to go downstairs. She tells me that it's protocol to let them in and search. So me and my boyfriend ran down the stairs as fast as we could to open the door, lamps still in hand. We opened the door for the cops and told them that someone's here and what we heard. They walk into the house telling us to wait outside while they investigate. One officer goes straight outside to the back and he yells into the door. If anyone is out here, make yourself known. Me and my boyfriend heard rustling through the bushes near us. The officers didn't find anyone in the home, but we knew someone had been there. We knew what we heard. Fast forward a couple of months later, we were watching a movie about an invasion. I believe it was Open House on Netflix. We got to talking about our experience together. I come to find out that the same day of the invasion, I believe I met the intruder. I remember I was walking outside around morning time getting ready to get into my car when a young man walking by asked me if the car in their driveway was for sale. I said, I'm not sure. I'm dog sitting for them but they should be back in a few days. He thanked me kindly for telling him and walked off. I looked at the car next to mine in the driveway and it didn't have a for sale sign anywhere. 
I had no idea at the time what I had done, but I know that the man walking by was our invader. I still am afraid to dog sit again. I work as a night auditor for a rather large international chain of hotels. It is a good job, but a bit boring. It's easy and the pay is far from mediocre for a college student. When I got in one night, the second shift guys told me to be on the lookout for a man connected to a stabbing earlier in the day. I shrugged it off. The hotel was located in a rather safe spot, the intersect between city and county patrol so you'd see a marked car just about every hour. I wasn't worried about the man running up into my hotel. I guess that's how most of these stories start off, isn't it? Yeah, well, maybe I should have given a bit more head to my fellow associate's warning. About two hours in, I was enjoying the isolation of the back room, the door locked, the CCTV on screen, and Netflix on another. All of a sudden, from the corner of my eye, I see somebody walk right in front of camera 3, which is located at the front door. Great, a customer. No, I wish it was. So a bit of backstory about the guy who stabbed another man. He was drunk, wrecked his car, called a tow truck and stabbed the driver in the neck for some reason. The guy proceeded to evade police for well over 30 miles in a gigantic pink tow truck. So, I reckon he parked it somewhere nearby and decided a hotel is a great place to lay low. So I met him at the front desk, sweating bullets. I was trying to maintain my cool. I let the guy check in even though his card declined, gave him his room key and watched him go up on the cameras until I was sure he was in his room. I immediately called the police. The guy got arrested. The officers enjoyed the hotel coffee and I had the kitchen crew whip him up some muffins. I'm a single male who lives alone in Denver. My apartment complex is not what you would call a nice building. I'm on a road close to Colfax Avenue, which if you're familiar with the geography of this area, it's not the safest boulevard in town. I'm a few streets away from it, but close enough that I would consider this an up-and-coming neighborhood. This evening I was watching Netflix on my couch. My two cats were cuddled up against me as I lay under a comforter. The night before, I'd watched a horror movie that was scary enough to leave me in an unsettled mood, making it hard for me to sleep. So this night, I decided to watch a stand-up special instead keeping it light so I wouldn't have any trouble getting some shut-eye. I had classes early the next morning, so I was surprised when I made the conscious decision to turn on a second stand-up special and let myself fall asleep on the couch. I was just so comfy where I lay and I didn't want to move, not even to turn off the several lights on throughout my apartment. I remember dozing off around 11 o'clock. It was effortless which meant I was really snug under the covers with my cats flanking me on either side, creating a tucked-in feeling. I fell into a dream where I was on an impromptu date with this guy, whom I didn't recognize, at a blockbuster video store. He bought me blue and yellow underwear, insinuating I would take the hint of his intentions. He was also desperate for a job, so when we got to the counter, he was given an off-the-cuff interview that didn't go well and all of a sudden I'm not sleeping anymore. I'm woken up by a knock at my door, and a man's voice says, Maintenance. I just sat there, sitting upright on my couch. I knew something was off. I looked at my phone, which was by my left hand, and the time was 2.15am. I didn't move. The floors in my apartment are old wood, and there are many creaky floorboards. I didn't want whoever was knocking to know someone was home and awake, let alone alert to his presence. My cats got up and ran over to the door as they normally would, but I stayed and listened. After a few minutes with no answer, 
the man walked away from the door and down the hallway to the stairs. A moment after that, I heard the back door to the building swing open and close. I have one window where I have a partial view of that door, so I break my paralysis and race over to it. I saw an old green SUV sitting in the no parking zone just in front of the back door. It must have been running the entire time because I didn't hear it start up and the brake lights were glowing red. Someone, presumably the maintenance man, got into the car and drove it off. I don't know what his intentions were, but no one knocks on someone's door at 2.15am claiming to work for the landlord with good deeds in mind. Had it been a true emergency, wouldn't he have knocked again, even used his service key to get into the unit? What did I just avoid here? I can only assume it was an attempted robbery at best, or an abduction at worst. When I was watching the SUV drive off, I surveyed the other apartment windows. They were all dark. I can see every unit except the two other corner apartments below me from that vantage point. I think because my apartment sticks out from the building and has many windows, I was targeted because my lights were visibly on and noticeable from the street. However, I don't know how this individual got into the building in the first place, as you would need a key to do so. I've never been so legitimately afraid as a single person living alone. I'm grateful I installed a security chain on my door when I moved in. I'm also glad that even in my disoriented state, I had the presence of mind not to move from the couch or make any noise. As I recount that event, I can't stop my eyes from tearing up. My nerves are definitely shot. I don't think I'll be going back to dreamland anytime soon. I've turned off all the lights, save for the lamp by my bed. I usually can't sleep with it on. Tonight, I don't think I could sleep with it off. I'm currently living in Mexico, in a city that's not known as a dangerous place. A lot of foreigners live here and I haven't heard any safety concerns. I'm living with my cousin who works from 8am to 7pm. The houses are in a pretty good area with a school, a nice hotel, and a Starbucks within walking distance. This incident happened while my aunt was visiting us from Mexico City. She stayed home all day with me while I usually studied or watched Netflix. On this day, I was planning on having a chill day since I had woken up around 11.30am. I'm watching something on my computer when I start to hear some loud pounding like someone was working on something with a hammer. I thought my aunt had let someone in to repair something. I was under the assumption my aunt was still in the house, so I wasn't too worried, and I continued to watch my show. The hard noises stopped, and I heard two male voices talking casually. This made me feel more confident that they were there to fix something. I get up from my bed to fetch my phone to message my aunt on Facebook to see what's going on. I didn't get a reply from her, so I just took it as she was busy. I go back to lying on the bed, not thinking anything of the noises. Five minutes later, I hear footsteps coming up the stairs. Bear in mind, I'm lying on my bed with my back to the door when the door opens, and I see a man. He was a pretty, normal-looking guy with facial hair and dressed rather clean. Kinda like if you saw him in public, you wouldn't think anything negative about him. As soon as he saw me, he shut my door and went downstairs. Then I heard another huge noise that I later realized was him slamming the front door. My room is the first room that you come to going up the stairs, so my first thought was this repairman accidentally opened my door. I thought he was trying to get access to our patio. I was a little confused, but again, I didn't think anything of the situation. I slowly walk down the stairs, calling for my aunt's name, but I get no response. As soon as I make it down the stairs, I hear my aunt in a panicked voice saying, They just robbed us. They took the TV. She forgot to lock the first iron door of the house, which made it easy for them to break open the second door. 
She said that when she was walking by from the store, she noticed someone by the house. She asked him what he wanted and he said he was looking for a teacher. Then he got into a car with another man and they left. She didn't notice the TV in their car or anything suspicious until she got to the house. She mentioned that someone had rang the doorbell before she left to the store and when she went to check, no one was there. She believes they've been watching her and my cousin, so when they opened my bedroom door, they were caught off guard and dipped. It's just really frightening to think about what could have happened if they didn't get scared off by seeing me. The cops came and were telling me they often kidnap girls or assault them. I know I got lucky. I was celebrating the end of another year at my house with three of my friends. My dad was out at a friend's party for New Year and my younger sister was at a sleepover as well. We were in the living room waiting for the cookies we'd baked to be ready and we were eating the raw leftover cookie dough. We were watching Netflix but being teenage girls with no cooking skills for anything but pastries, we'd ordered a shit ton of pizza and fast food from the local pizza shop. So when someone knocked at my door, we originally thought nothing of it. I mumbled a comment about delivery people not knowing what a doorbell was and got up pausing the TV and paid the delivery guy. I went back to my friends and we started to dig in still watching TV and then this is the moment I don't think I can forget. Everything was so vivid. The door to the living room was shut and the curtains closed. TV at near full volume. We were all intently focused, either throwing comments out at the TV or just letting out sounds of surprise. This began just as the final fight of the season started. My best friend Ali had shouted, he can turn into a fucking wolf. At the same time, we heard an aggressive bang at the front door, but we didn't fully register it because of Ali shouting and the loud soundtrack. I paused the TV, waiting a minute, when another bang came to the door. I got up, curious who it could be. We weren't expecting anyone else to come to the door. I stuck my head out of the living room, seeing a man stood at the door. And because I'm a teenage girl with only two other teenagers, I obviously didn't answer it. But I stood in the doorway, able to watch him to make sure he left. But he didn't. He banged on the door rhythmically. Now, my friends and me are different people. I'm very paranoid and organized, whereas they are more relaxed. They told me to sit back down and he'd leave, but then the door handle shook aggressively. Call the fucking police, I said quickly. My phone was upstairs in my room charging, so Ali called 999. She was speaking with the operator when everything seemed to slow down. The man had thrown a rock at the window in our door, and the key was in the lock. In order to get it out, I'd have to go towards him. The police told us to find a place to hide with a lock, but no room had one. The bolt on the bathroom had been broken ever since we moved in, but we never had a reason to fix it. So we ran out of the living room into the kitchen, and I had two ideas. Number one, get a knife in case I had to defend myself, or at least just threaten him. Number two, get out Storm. Storm was my dad's dog. He was a security and ex-police dog, so I grabbed his lead, got him out of his cage and clipped it on, and me and my friends went to the backyard with a knife and dog. The man opened the door to the yard where we all stood. I tried not to look scared, but this man had to be about 40. Long, greasy blonde hair and blank blue eyes. They seemed to not have any emotions behind them but his mouth was in a twisted grin. He was holding a hunting knife. Storm was barking loudly at him, but the man didn't falter. I was hesitant to let Storm off because I didn't want him to get hurt. Come closer and I'll let him off, I shouted. The man just kept walking. I backed away to stand next to my friends. The second I let Storm off, we get the knife. I whispered and my friends nodded. 
Ali still had the operator on the phone, who said anything we did could be classified as self-defense. Go, I ordered Storm, letting him off the lead. Storm lunged at the man, knocking him backwards, causing the knife to drop, but it wasn't too far away from the guy. Storm had a tight grip on his arm, and I ran over, kicking the knife away from him. This went on for maybe 10 to 20 minutes when the police came in, and I got Storm away from the man. My dad was called and came straight home to make sure we were okay, which we luckily were. We later found out the man was a convicted sex offender who had moved in two streets down. He had seen me walking Storm and our other dog a lot. I'm so thankful we have Storm and that my dad taught me how to deal with difficult and dangerous situations, because I don't know what would have happened if we just sat watching TV. I lived in Japan for around 10 months a couple of years back, as part of a study abroad program as my placement year for university. I lived in Hiroshima, and pretty much every Japanese person I met was exactly how you'd expect them, generous and respectful. I'll accept this one old lady who just so happened to live in the apartment next to me. It was about a month after I'd been in Japan when our group of gaijins decided we were going to the Saijo Sake Festival. For those who don't know, this is a huge sake drinking festival that, from what I now understand, everyone goes to and gets extremely drunk. As men of fine taste and culture, we sampled many different kinds of sake from all over Japan, and we got wrote off beyond belief. Then we all got the train home back to our apartments. I can't remember shit all, apart from calling my girlfriend at the time and passing out on my futon. Normal stuff. Skip to 6am the next morning, when my loudest fuck doorbell wakes me up. I check the time and I'm confused as anything, but I just assume it's my friend from downstairs who wants to talk about the night previous. I look through the people in my door and I see a police officer standing there. The first thought that goes through my mind is, Taylor, what the fuck have you done when you were drunk last night? But at the same time, I was so sure I just fell asleep right away. I talk to the guy using a translation app, and he basically tells me there's been a noise complaint. Strange, considering the fact all I did was make a phone call and fall asleep. Anyway, the guy sees how confused I am, and just kinda sees there must have been a mistake and leaves. I'm honestly still drunk and really confused, but the day carries on as normal. The next morning, 6am, the doorbell rings. I already kind of assumed what it was going to be this time, and what do I see through the people this time? Two police officers. The same conversation goes down, and I convince them there's been no noise. I literally walk them into my apartment to show them how I fell asleep watching Netflix. They tell me at this point it's the neighbor making the complaint. I've never met her before. They think she might just be being racist to me. I ask the guy at my university who takes care of all foreign students about this, and he tells me I'm getting moved apartments to a room on the floor below. I'm pretty pissed because I just settled into my new space, but whatever. He plans on coming the morning after with the landlord to move my shit out and check my new room is okay. Do you ever get it when you get woken up by something in the middle of the night, and it really fucks you up? I went to sleep on good time that night and prepped for the people helping move my stuff out. So naturally, at 3am, I'm fast asleep, and then suddenly, the doorbell rapidly rings. It's deafening and of course has woken me up straight away. I can't even begin to tell you how scared I was. I couldn't move. I didn't want to. After about a minute of what felt like incessant noise, complete silence. I make my way over to the front door to look through the peephole, and I see nothing. Something inside me tells me it's this psycho neighbor. Nothing else happens that night, and I eventually get back to sleep. I wake up the next morning kind of shaken, but it's okay because my boys are coming around soon. 
I keep walking out the front to check if they're downstairs and quickly close my door behind me because I don't know what this woman would do if she sees me. I walk into my room and the sliding door to my balcony is open and there I see her for the first time. She's literally wrapped her body around the fence that separates our balconies whilst keeping her footing on the side and is just staring at me. We stare at each other for a second and then she quickly whips back round onto her side. Literally two seconds later, my doorbell rings. I think to myself, no, that's not possible. This is some demon shit. I'm so fucked. Thank God it turns out to be the people to help move my stuff. I tell them what's up and hastily move downstairs to my new room. Outside of her turning up at my new room once and asking if the police had visited, I was able to avoid her from then out. I guess the police decided to start ignoring her calls. We've all likely heard of airdrop, right? It's pretty common these days, and most smartphones have this capability. Just in case you aren't familiar with it, airdrop is a function used to share files such as photos, videos, URLs, and documents. If you're connected by Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, people who aren't on your contact list can share files with you. Although it's considered very useful by most, it can be dangerous and frightening. There have been reports of people using the airdrop function on late night trains to send indecent images to fellow passengers. We call these people in Japan airdrop chicken and in English airdrop pervs. This disgusting act has become widespread as of late. So this is a scary incident which happened via airdrop. It didn't happen to me but a co-worker at my company. He worked for a temp agency. Every night he would catch the last train home. It was always pretty crowded then. Our office's location was in Ikei Bikoro. One night, he was able to get a seat. This was rare on that train. He said he was idly scrolling through his social media on his phone, feeling as if he was about to fall asleep, when he saw a new notification on his phone. It was a notification of an incoming airdrop. Due to his reflexes and perhaps tiredness, he just tapped on the notification and approved the airdrop. The file he received was just a solid black picture. He wondered if someone had sent something by accident. However, the very next night he was traveling back home, his phone alerted him to another incoming airdrop. Out of pure curiosity, he accepted it again. It was the same black image. He thought that whoever had sent this image the day before was on the train with him again. It creeped him out a bit since he no longer considered it an accident. The next night, just as he, and perhaps you, thought, he received another black image via airdrop. He looked around the train to see if he could see anyone looking his way, or to see if anyone else was looking as if they had received the same strange file. Why send just a black image? What is the intention behind it? He wondered. He considered the idea that he might have gotten a stalker. He knew that whatever it was wasn't good news. He said he was becoming a bit frightened at this point. He said he had spoken to his co-workers about it. His co-worker showed him how to block airdrops from third parties. Now he shouldn't be able to receive any more unwanted files. That was good, but it didn't solve the mystery of who had been sending him the black image each night. His co-worker said that he had a friend who was a specialist in photography and he could ask him to take a look at the black photo. He was more than happy to share the photo if it helped solve the mystery, so he sent it to his colleague. The next night, he was on the train home, watching everyone suspiciously. He said that he felt very uncomfortable. He felt as if someone was watching him. He came into work the following day and his colleague came over to him. Hey... You know that image you asked my friend to take a look at, he began. His colleague said that they found something disturbing when they played with the brightness, contrast, and hue. They found something hidden in the black photo. 
His co-worker showed him what was beneath the black photo and he gasped. There was a creepy looking abandoned building. The photo seemed to be taken internally. There were these charms and talismans placed all over the walls. What on earth is that? He wondered. He said he felt something so inherently disturbing and evil about the photo, he had to erase it. I scolded him because I wanted to see. He said nothing else has happened but he is very wary of riding the train late at night. He always thinks someone is watching him. I often wonder why someone chose to send him that image. Was it a clue to some sort of crime? Was it an invitation? Okay, I can safely say that this is the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. This happened when I was living on the outskirts of Tokyo. I was drinking in a bar right next to the station one night, me and my three girlfriends. It was literally right in front of the ticket gate. We didn't finish drinking until 2am. It was a great night. We headed up the stairs by the station. On the other side of the pedestrian walkway bridge, there was a taxi rank. I lived close by, but my friends didn't. They were getting a cab. We'd crossed the bridge and we were on our way down the stairs on the other side of the bridge when a man passed us going up the stairs. I remember he was kind of small. There were no people in the area. It was dead. It was 2am in the countryside. A taxi approached and we said our drunken goodbyes. I was stood there a bit bleary-eyed, thinking, shall I walk home? I decided it would help walk off tomorrow's inevitable hangover, so I started up the stairs again, and that's when I saw the man stood in the middle of the walkway, completely still. He was just staring at me. I didn't give him any eye contact, I just headed back down the stairs to hang out by the taxi rank. Yeah, a taxi would be the safest way home, I thought, but it was late at night, and this wasn't in the big city, there were no cabs around. My friends were lucky to get one. I was freaked out by being alone with this weirdo, so I headed towards a 24-7 restaurant. I glanced over my shoulder and saw that the man was advancing quickly. I panicked. I thought that running would be a good idea. Just as I got into a decent stride, I felt a cold hand clasp around my wrist. Hey, let's go have some fun. An even colder voice ordered. It was a surprisingly young voice for such a disturbing act. At a guess, I would say this guy was about 30. I broke free from his grasp and shouted, I'm going home. The man's eyes never wavered. They just kept fixed on me, and I'll never forget what he said next. Didn't you hear me? I told you. I didn't ask. Let's go and have some fun. I was so scared I couldn't respond. I just shook my head to indicate no. He tutted at me. I just want you to come and look at something. Just for a second, that's all. He was messing around in his pockets and then he pulled out his phone. I told him no countless times. He was shouting at me to look at something. I tried to make a run for it into the restaurant, but he grabbed me again. Didn't you hear me? Can't you hear me? I just want to show you something, okay? Just look at it. At this point, he's looking towards the sky and shouting for me to look at whatever he's looking at. I mean, he is really shouting and pointing towards the sky. Using this as an opportunity, I screamed. It must have been barely audible beneath the creep's shouts, but somehow a taxi driver heard it. What's the matter? The taxi driver called. This caused the creepy guy to shake and drop his phone. I don't know why I looked, but I did. And he had written a text which read, Look up. What's that? The weirdo grabbed his phone and tried to make a break for it. The taxi driver chased him and caught him by the wrist. How do you like it? I thought. The taxi driver told him to stay where he was and said that he was calling the police. This caused the creep to go mad. He aimed brutal, desperate kicks at the driver 
and then produced a small knife from his back pocket. I told you all to look up, the man shouted. The taxi driver looked up for a second and the man calmed down. He picked up his phone and put his knife away and calmly began walking over to the bridge back to the station. I'm not sure how long it took the police to arrive, but I understand it was all on CCTV. I was never interviewed, and neither was the taxi driver. Be careful out there, guys. This happened last year in summer, maybe at the beginning of June, and I was 17. I was on my way to get some camp leader training for volunteering abroad. I'm not very talkative with strangers. It takes some time for me to open up, and I thought I'd get out of my comfort zone and learn something new. It was really hot outside. I had at least three hours of traveling by buses and trains. Once I got to the capital, I traveled by train. It was packed, so I couldn't sit down anywhere but by the door on the steps. I sat down and plugged my headphones in, and then a man walked in and sat down uncomfortably close. I couldn't move anywhere. Out of nowhere, he starts talking to me. I pretend not to hear him while I look out the little window, but he taps me on my shoulder and I'm really nervous and polite, so I take off one of my headphones, hoping he just wants to know where his stop is. I hear out what he has to say. He asked me what I was listening to. At this point I can kind of hear he slurring his words and his eyes are a little red and glossy. I don't think he had a face mask on either. I kind of nervously shrugged my shoulders and did the eye smile at him. He was trying to do some small talk with me, but I really wasn't listening. I was just nodding, wondering how long I would have to stay on the train. He constantly tried to get me to talk and answer everything he said. His tone got a bit passive-aggressive a few times. I was scared not to answer. At one point, a man walked past us to use the toilet. I tried to give him a pleading look, but they greeted each other as if they were buddies. That man probably didn't have a ticket because he stayed there the whole time I was on the train. After a while, he got back to my music. He said that we should each pick our favorite song and give them to each other to listen to. I was creeped out, so I did. Then the chair hit the fan. He said, Why don't you take off your mask? I bet you're pretty. I was shaking, and then he extended his hand towards me to try to take off my mask. I put my hand in a cross gesture to protect myself and said no. I don't know what he was thinking. I'm a nervous smiler, so I just chuckled very uncomfortably, and he tried this multiple times after that. I kept doing the crossed wrists gesture to protect myself and saying no each time. Then he asked me to guess his age. I did. He said he was 36. He then asked me and I said 16, hoping that he'd shut up or at least tone it down. But no. He got closer and examined the sleeve of my shirt, saying it's nice. I was almost pissing myself at this point, and then the conductor walks to us. Thank God, or not, because when I looked at him, almost tearing up, he ignored me and walked away. Then this guy playfully nudges the side of my thigh while still complimenting me and trying to get me to take my mask off. Then he gets up to get a cigarette and walks into the toilet to the second guy. He told me to let him know when I was getting off. Fuck no. As soon as he got into the bathroom, I grabbed my bags and walked two wagons away from the one I was in. I finally took in a few breaths while people looked at me weird. I must have looked like a mess. When the train arrived at my stop, I booked it and kept looking over my shoulder at the train station, as well as down the street. I decided to change into my long hoodie in case he was somewhere behind me. Luckily, he didn't follow me. I called one of my parents on the way to my final destination, absolutely out of breath. My other parent called me later, assuring I was alright. I haven't told any of the leaders at the event about it. I don't know what would have happened if he didn't go for that smoke but I'm certainly glad he was stupid enough to hope I'd let him know when I was getting off. 
Writing this or talking about it makes me feel like I'm there on that train again. And the worst thing is, so many people I know have similar experiences. Why do some people have to be so creepy? This living nightmare began recently. It all happened when I took the late night train home. There was a man standing in the same carriage as me. He was almost at the opposite end. I noticed that he was staring at me. He wasn't exactly being subtle about it. He was about five foot nine and he was middle aged and kind of chubby. He was tired looking and he was wearing a gray suit. When I looked towards him, he didn't stop staring. I went back to my phone but I hated his eyes on me. I'm a woman in her 20s. This guy creeped me out to be honest. It's not a surprise to run into a perv on this line. It goes right through the red light district. I tried not to give it much thought and I went home without incident that night. This happened one night in March. A few weeks later I was riding the train. It was a weekend night I think. I remember the train being pretty busy. I saw that creep again and he was staring at me from a distance like before. I tried to ignore him and just focus on my phone, but from the corner of my eye, I could see him pushing through the crowd to get close to me. I was worried because this train line is also known for groping, especially during rush hour. He was trying to move through a crowd to stand behind me. I was getting scared now. Luckily, I could see my reflection in the carriage's windows whenever we passed through somewhere dark. I thought about what I could do. I had my phone in hand ready to call the police if he did anything. I braced myself, but he didn't touch me. I kept watching him in the reflections of the windows, and I could see that he was smelling my hair. It grossed me out so much that I felt physically sick. I thought that even if I called the cops on him, they wouldn't be interested. I mean, I guess I had a weak case. I thought he smelled my hair. So once again I went home without further incident. A month or two passed and then I saw that creep for the first time outside of the train. It was night. I got off at my station and started walking home. After a while, I noticed that there was someone walking behind me. A few moments later and he was right behind me. I turned my head to take a peek over my shoulder and I realized that it was the train guy. Once again, he was staring right at me. I was really frightened, so once I got to the end of the road, I slowed down to allow him to pass. He did pass, but he kept staring at me with every step he took. Then, as if he changed his mind, he stopped in his tracks and stared at me. I felt so freaked out by this man, I had to run to the nearest light source, which happened to be a convenience store. I hung out there for a while and then I ran home. Hardly any time passed before the next time I had a run in with that man. I was heading home late again due to overtime. I was on the train at around midnight. I was walking down this dark road. It was near pitch black and a bicycle whizzed past me from behind. As it went by, the cyclist turned his head to look at me and I recognized him straight away. It was that weirdo from the train. This time I was just wearing a t-shirt and shorts. He kept looking back at me as he was cycling away and then he stopped, stared a while, and then slowly started cycling back toward me down the narrow alley we were both in. I ran again, this time on the phone to the police. I scrambled into a nearby business hotel and the police sent a patrol car to the neighborhood to look for the guy. The next time I ran into the creep was just last month. I was walking home like normal and someone grabbed me from behind. It was so horrible. It was like he came right out of the shadows. I hated the idea of being touched by that man. I screamed and kicked out at him like an animal. I broke free and before I saw his face, I knew it was that man. He started walking toward me and I was saved by an employee of a local restaurant who had heard the commotion. I called the police again, 
but I felt they were being kind of standoffish. I didn't feel safe. The next incident occurred only a few days ago, last Friday night actually. I arrived at my station at around 11pm. I didn't want to be out late, but I had to go to a co-worker's birthday drinks. I was a little more confident that night and less scared, but I guess that was because I had a couple of drinks on board. Then all that confidence went out the window when the man appeared. It was like the first time I saw him. He was wearing a grey coat and a grey suit. He was stood there doing his usual disturbing things, staring at me. Before I knew it, I was running. I guess it's true what they say about fight or flight, right? I'd never been so scared in my life. Why couldn't this guy just leave me alone? My heart started thundering in my chest when I heard his heavy footfall coming up behind me. He was chasing me. Thankfully, like I said before, the guy was pretty chubby so I was easily able to pull away from him. I guess I'm fortunate that my parents made me join the track and field club back in school. I got home safely and I was relieved but concerned. I am certain that this man is stalking me. There is no real end to this story, as it is an ongoing part of my life at the moment. This happened last October when I was on my way home from a drinking night with my work colleagues. I caught the last train home and I arrived at my station just as it came up to 1am. It was Halloween, something I didn't particularly care about since we don't really do much for it here in Japan. I live in quite a rural area so the station was empty, or so I thought. As I walked down towards the ticket gate, I saw a woman in a costume. A bit too old to be a trick-or-treater, I thought, as I drew closer to her. She was wearing a witch costume. She looked as if she was waiting for someone. At the moment I passed her, she abruptly called out to me, Where do you live? I continued walking, it was surreal. I looked over my shoulder. She was just stood there, staring at me. She had long, dark, messy hair, and I remember only one of her eyes was visible through her hair. She freaked me out. It was really bright in the station, but she seemed to bring a darkness. I don't really know how else to explain it, but it felt like there was a light out above her head, but there wasn't. Don't get involved. Do not respond, I told myself. I upped my pace and headed out the exit. It takes about 15 minutes to get home from the station on foot, and at that time of night in my rural area, I knew there would be no one on the streets. It made me a bit nervous. While walking home, I heard a dog howling and my footsteps seemed to echo behind me. I kept looking over my shoulder. I turned a corner to see someone stood under a streetlight, the silhouette of a woman. I wanted to pass by quickly. Something was really off about tonight. It's the first time I've ever been worried on Halloween. Where do you live? A familiar voice asked. Shivers raced up and down my spine. It was the woman in the Halloween costume from the station. I looked back and she took a step toward me. I just bolted. I ran, looking over my shoulder as fast as I could. I ran out of breath and got a stitch. Too many damn beers. I had to stop. I was in a dark alley. I looked back and I couldn't see the woman anymore. I walked down the alley relieved. Where do you live? I froze in place. What the hell was happening? I was shaking. I couldn't see her at all this time. I didn't even hear her coming. It sounded as if she was directly above me. I spun around in all directions. I was really panicking now. I shut my eyes for a second and saw her slowly walking toward me. Where do you live? Why? Why was this happening? My legs were trembling even though I was still drunk. I've never felt that before or since. I didn't know what to do. She wouldn't leave me alone, and if I walked home, she would surely follow me. 
so I just pointed to a random house across the street from the alley and blurted out, There, I live there. The woman in the costume turned her head slowly towards the house I was pointing at and then smiled. She looked back at me one last time, still smiling, and then back toward the house. Now with this strange woman distracted, I took my opportunity to run for it again. I kept looking over my shoulder to see if she was following me, but she was stood still staring at the house I pointed at. She was so creepy. Was this just some Halloween prank? I had no idea, but I didn't want to stick around to find out. I got home and triple checked all the doors and windows were locked. I stayed up half the night checking the window to see if the woman was out there, but I didn't see her. Time went by but I couldn't forget about that strange experience. I can't really remember her face. My memory is a bit hazy. I get the shivers every now and then when I think about that night. A few weeks later on a Sunday, I was taking a walk with my daughter in the neighborhood and I noticed a moving truck. The truck was parked outside the house I pointed at. Where do you live? I remembered the woman's voice and I shuddered. I thought to myself at the time, it's a coincidence that the people who live there are moving out, but I wondered if something happened to them. Then the owners of the house came out holding boxes, looking exhausted and miserable. I guess something could have happened to them. In the house, I saw the silhouette of a woman, but it couldn't be that woman, could it? I couldn't be sure. I just grabbed my child's hand and started to walk away. I don't go anywhere near that house now. This happened a few years ago when I was about 13. I'm 5 foot 7 and about 125 pounds, so I'm pretty small. But I usually have pepper spray and a pocket knife on me. I am embarrassed to say though, in the excitement of exploration with my best friends, I forgot my pepper spray and knife. I love to explore and travel, even, or especially, in places I'm not allowed. So when I moved in, of course one of the first places I explored was the train tracks. So I had my best friend come over one day to explore the neighborhood with me and we decided the train tracks were a perfect place to explore. We were walking for over an hour or two, but it was still light outside and we had just passed a small neighborhood street, so we felt safe. But when I turned around to throw a stick, I saw five hooded figures following us from about 200 feet away. I tried to pretend I didn't see them and I told my best friend calmly, we decided to look them straight on and see what they would do. Once we looked at them, they stopped. So did my friend and I. We stared at each other for a few seconds, but it felt like hours. Finally, they made their move. Two of them went left and two of them went to the right. We heard the sound of loud and fast footsteps, so we finally snapped out of our trance and ran as fast as we could. We were both in cross country and we were being held together by adrenaline, so we could run faster than we ever had before. Luckily, because I explored on those same train tracks a few days prior, I knew if we ran half a mile more, we would be on a bridge above another small neighborhood. We somehow made it. We had no clue if we were still being followed or not, but out of fear, we jumped 10 feet down and kept running deep into the neighborhood until we finally saw other people. We then walked slowly home, shaking and exhausted. Looking back now, I regret not telling my parents, but I was scared they wouldn't let me explore alone anymore. I did not go on those train tracks again, and I never will. So I was 10 years old at the time, and it was summer break after finishing 5th grade, maybe the 2nd or 3rd week of June. I don't really remember why, 
but my mom had to go to a dinner with some of her co-workers from the daycare she worked at one night. She left my older sister, who was only 12, to watch over me, but my older sister was more so there to make sure that the house didn't burn down rather than watch over me. So that night, my mom left for the dinner and she said she would be right back. I remember I was in the living room and my older sister was upstairs in her room. I was downstairs with Fenrir, who was a black Newfoundland that I grew up with my entire life. Unfortunately, by the time I was 10, he was showing his age. He couldn't walk, run, or stand up like he used to. We would usually have to help him get up and walk him outside to the backyard, which had a porch. The porch had a walkway we built so that Fenrir could walk down easier. We would also have to bring his food and water bowls over to him as he was always too tired to get up. So I'm watching TV in the living room with Fenrir lying down by the side of the couch. Suddenly I hear this loud growling. I muted the TV, turned around, and saw Fenrir growling and snarling at something. He then started barking at whatever it was. I looked over and saw that he was directing his attention at the back door that led to the backyard, but I didn't see anything. It was pitch black outside. Suddenly Fenrir just stood up with seemingly little to no effort. He was violently growling, snarling, and barking. Keep in mind, he hasn't been able to get up by himself in a while, so to just see him stand up like he was young again scared the shit out of me. I used to say that it was as if Fenrir got possessed. He was still directing his attention to the back door. Before I could react, Fenrir suddenly jogged over to the back door. He got up on his hind legs and started scratching on the glass of the door, still growling and barking. At first I thought that a squirrel probably got up to the porch and came up to the door, but then I remembered that Fenrir wasn't aggressive towards squirrels. When he would see one when he was younger, he would bark and chase it, yes, but it was more so to scare the squirrel off rather than actually hurt it. And to add to that, Fenrir was not an aggressive dog. He was always sweet to people and other pets. He was usually calm, so to see him going feral like this actually scared me. He sounded like he wanted to kill something. I finally walked over to the back door that Fenrir was clawing at. I sort of pushed him away, surprised that he didn't snap at me, and I decided to put my face up against the glass to peek out and see if anything was there but I didn't see anything. All the while Fenrir is still scratching, growling and barking, and now baring his teeth and drooling to my right. I then walked to the right where there was a light switch that turned on the porch lights, and Fenrir went back into his spot, scratching and growling at whatever he was upset about. Then I flipped on the light. The second that happened, I saw a man dressed all in black, the classic burglar outfit gloves, ski mask, everything. At first he was seemingly looking into the door, his face and hands pressed up against it. When I turned on the lights, he got startled and took a few steps back. He then turned over to me and it was like time was frozen. We were both just frozen, staring at each other for a few seconds. And me being only 10 and not really knowing what to do, I quickly reached out to the knob of one of the back doors. More specifically, the door that Fenrir was scratching at. I swung the door open. The guy tried to run, but Fenrir was right on top of him. The guy wasn't even able to get off the porch before Fenrir latched onto him. When I say latched on, I mean latched on. Fenrir had bitten down on the guy's leg and then moved, and then he was biting down on the guy's arm. The guy tried to hit Fenrir off of him but he was just not able to. I was frozen, staring down at Fenrir, just really biting down on him. To be honest, I was more scared of my own dog than the guy that was most likely going to break in. I've never seen Fenrir be so aggressive in my entire life. I actually thought he was going to straight up kill the guy. Eventually, the guy screams in agony, which I guessed caused my sister to run down the stairs to see what was going on. My older sister was freaking out and eventually called 911. She then told me to go to my bedroom, 
which was also upstairs. So I did. I ran up to my bedroom and just stayed there. I was in shock at what I'd just seen and the whole situation in general. A while later, the police showed up and then my mom eventually afterwards. She burst through my bedroom and basically gave me the tightest bear hug I've ever gotten from her. I remember that she was also crying, worried sick that I was hurt. While I was shaken up, I wasn't physically hurt. At one point, I finally go downstairs and I see my older sister talking to a police officer while Fenrir was laying down next to her with some blood on his face. Not unlike Cujo. I remember thinking, oh god, Fenrir just killed somebody. And then I also remembered that when I put my face up against the glass on one of the back doors to see what Fenrir was pissed at, I most likely put my face directly where the guy still had his face up against it on the other side. So I made indirect eye contact with this guy before I turned on the lights without even knowing it. However, while the guy lost a lot of blood, he didn't die, and to be honest, I don't really know what happened to him afterwards, well other than he had to have gotten arrested. My mom was instantly looking into buying a new house and moving. We all eventually moved out when I was 11 or 12. Unfortunately before that, I developed my intense fear of dealing with intruders so much that I couldn't look outside the windows when it was pitch black outside for a while because I was afraid. I was afraid I was going to see a face right there. And second, a few months before we moved, we had to put Fenrir down because he was just too old. Needless to say that 2014 was the year that my childhood and innocence died. I'm now 18 years old and I've since been able to look outside windows when it's dark now. While I am still afraid of intruders, it's not really as bad as it used to be. When I move out, I'm definitely getting a big dog of my own. I will forever be thankful for you, Fenrir. Had it not been for you, who knows what that guy could have done to either me or my older sister. I was visiting Tokyo when it happened. I'm not from the big city, I'm from the countryside, but occasionally work brings me to the city. I caught the bus late at night and I slept the entire journey. I woke up as we arrived at Shinjuku Station. A quick glance at the watch told me it was approaching 9am. During the bus ride there were restroom breaks along the way, but I slept through them all, so when I woke up I was desperate. I literally had about a 30 second window to find a toilet, and a urinal wouldn't do. I tried my best to hold things off as I scoured the station for toilet signs. I don't know if you've ever been to Shinjuku Station, but it's massive. It's like a maze. So there I was, following the arrows for the toilet. You know, left, then a right, then a left again. Yeah. If that's not stressful enough when you're busting for the bathroom, imagine trying to weave in and out of the insane amount of commuters. Oh man, it was tough. So yeah, I was reaching my breaking point now. I managed to veer off into a quiet little passage. I found it. The holy grail, my friends. I was confused, but my judgement was lapsed, so I went ahead without asking any questions. I thanked him and went in. My ass hit the seat and I was in heaven. I was really proud that I made it in time. Then it dawned on me. There were two free stalls, so why the hell was he waiting? It must have been the next second or two when I noticed something in the gap in the toilet stall door. It burst through at tremendous speed. It was a long knife, kind of like the ones you use for sushi if you know that reference. It slid up and down, scraping the metal as it did. It jabbed towards me. It was so intimidating and terrifying. As the owner of that knife did this, he also rattled the door trying to get it open. I don't know how else to describe it, but I felt like prey. 
It was like I was some cornered animal and some predator was taunting me. All I could do was hold my knees up to my chest and get as far away as possible from the door. I was stuck like that for five minutes until the knife finally retracted and the rattling ceased. Enough was enough. I booted the door open with all my might in the hope that the outswinging door would injure the attacker, but he was gone. I called the police and tried to give a description of the man who let me go ahead of him in the toilet, but they didn't sound that interested. Man, Tokyo's creepy. This happened a couple of years ago when I went out with a bunch of friends for some drinks. I ended up staying later than I wanted to, which resulted in me dashing for the last train home. Thankfully, I made it in time. The train started off being quite packed, but it eventually emptied out. It was great to get a seat since I was pretty worse for wear. Before long, it was just me and some old salary man. He was wearing a white t-shirt and tie as well as business slacks. We were sitting at different ends of the train, but on the same side. We weren't opposite one another. He was asleep when I glanced over. Since I was tipsy, I shut my eyes for a couple of seconds, maybe about five or six at a guess, not a long amount of time. When I opened my eyes, I saw him. It seemed as if he had moved a few seats up toward me. At this point, I didn't know if I was a little drunk and forgot where he sat. So against my better judgment, I kind of ignored it. And before I knew it, I had closed my eyes again. Just like before, I'd only shut my eyes for a couple of seconds before I opened them. This time I opened them because I felt a bit uncomfortable. I realized the source of my unease. There was no mistake this time. He'd moved up the rows of seats closer to me. This was weird and creepy. I thought that this guy might be looking to pickpocket me. I was drunk and full of confidence for some reason, so I thought I would be the hero that this train needed. I decided to pretend to be asleep, and when I caught him in the act of attempting to rob me, I would turn him over to the station staff. Just as I suspected, as soon as I closed my eyes, he got up and stood in the center of the train. He didn't approach me like I thought he would though. Something weirder happened. Something that I will never forget. The man just stood there in the middle of the carriage and spun around and around. I watched this through half-open eyes, wondering what the hell was going on and questioning myself if I was imagining it or not. He then started to speak. Well, chant is more accurate, I suppose. He said something like, You can't trick me. You can't trick me. Pretend to be asleep, but you can't trick me. Horrible seconds crawled by as I listened to him shuffling around and murmuring his chant. I was still pretending to be asleep. His chant grew angrier and louder. His footsteps turned to stomps and then the train pulled into a station. I saw my chance and I bolted out of the train. It was too much for me. I waited until the last seconds before the train doors closed to make a break for it, so he wouldn't have the chance to follow me. This resulted in me walking over two hours in the dark, but anything was better than being on that train. So, one night, I was out drinking with some buddies, and my hobby came up later in the night. The place we were at was starting to die down, so my buddies asked me if there was anywhere cool nearby we could go to. The first place that popped into my head was an old abandoned factory that was in the woods, probably a 5-10 to 10 minute drive away. So we went. No, I didn't quite remember the path to get there. We have to leave the trail at some point. There was cloud cover, so visibility was really low, and one of my buddies is pretty unathletic thanks to diabetes, so I had them stay on the trail as I fumbled around in the dark to make sure we were going in the right direction. When I finally got back, they asked how far out I went, 
because they heard something walk by parallel to the trail. I shook it off and dismissed it as a stray dog or something, and I led them into the woods until we hit the fence. I then started leading them along the fence to the hole someone cut forever ago. And when we're getting close, I hear footsteps that weren't ours, maybe 15 feet to the right of us, and I stop dead in my tracks. In that moment, my entire body was screaming at me to run, and the only thing that went through my head in that moment was, those were human. I turned back to my friends, and judging by the looks on their faces, they heard it too. I told my friends we should skip this for tonight and head back. They quickly agreed and started back to the trail, as I stayed behind to make sure whoever was there did not follow them. As I waited for them to get further away, I didn't hear or see anything move, and once I assumed they were back at the trail, I took off running after them and we quickly made it back to the car. Since then, I've chalked it up to some homeless guy going through the same place to crash for the night, but it felt like they were following us. And for whatever reason, they triggered my fight or flight really hard. Years ago, on a beautiful early September afternoon, my brother and a couple of his friends, and me and a couple of mine, went to a local county fair. While there, we met a group of four guys in merged groups. We were having so much fun that we decided to keep the party going after we left the fair. Everyone followed me to my apartment, where we called another friend, whose family owned the local single-story motel. She hooked us up with a room at the end, far away from the other guests, and we were off to the races. It was a fun night. Lots of laughing, conversation, drinking, all that. I really enjoyed chatting with one of the new guys, but there was another one who I didn't like. He was very competitive with the other guys, bragging himself up and constantly making fun of them. He didn't add anything interesting to conversations. He wasn't very bright and had a locker room style humor that I've never enjoyed. No biggie, not everybody clicks. I probably didn't say more than a couple of words to him that night. The party eventually ended, and everyone went their separate ways. A couple of weeks later, I'm home on a Saturday night, when the doorbell rings. I open it up, and it was that annoying guy. He told me that he's cruising town with a friend, asked if I'd like to join them. I was honestly pretty bored, so I agreed to go, and then we headed downstairs. The car was the type with two bucket seats in the front. A dip between them with an emergency brake in it, and a bench seat in the back. When the annoying guy told me to slide over in the front to sit between him and the driver, I laughed and said, that wouldn't be comfortable at all, and I climbed into the back. We started rolling, and I noticed that the driver was not one of the three guys we met at the fair. I felt a bit disappointed, but sucked it up. After all, the annoying guys of the friends were amazing and this guy might be too. I threw out a conversation starter, crickets from the driver, and more urging from the annoying guy to crawl into the front seat. I try another topic, same response, and now I'm picking up tense vibes from the driver. I don't know what the annoying guy had intended, but alarm bells were going off and I wanted out. I coolly tapped the driver on the shoulder, said I decided to go home and turn in early and he promptly turned around and headed back to my place. In the five minutes I was in his car, he hadn't said one word to me, but I swear, I felt him relax immediately when I ended the evening. Once home, I got out of the car as fast as I could and said bye, and then proceeded up the walk. I heard the car back up and drive away with relief, but when I got to the door of my building, something made me turn around. That annoying guy was right behind me. I was pissed. You'd better run if you want to catch your ride, I said. It's too late. I'll never catch him. Guess you're walking home in the dark then, I replied. Okay, but I need to use your bathroom first. So, folks, I ended up saying okay for a lot of predictable reasons. 
I was young, didn't have much of a backbone, and had been raised like most girls, to be polite. It was obvious he was creeping on me. He might have actually had dark intentions. I was furious with him, and I still said okay. Everything turned out alright, but I still hate that that's what happened. Please learn from my mistakes. Fuck politeness. I let us into the apartment and stay by the door while he uses the bathroom. He comes out and sits on the far right end of the couch. He kind of slides back, cups his hand behind his neck, and puts his fucking feet on my coffee table. Then, wearing an I win grin, he tells me he's not going anywhere. I stand there numbly for a bit, flipping through my options. At this point, I'm standing in front of a narrow piece of wall between the door on my right and the end of the sofa on my left, both within touching distance. The outrage and fury overtake me, and I know what I'm gonna do. I surprise him by grabbing a shirt front with both hands, pulling him up and to the right, then shoving him against the narrow wall space. I place my left forearm across his chest, pin him with all my weight, all while opening the door with my right hand. I hold the door with my right foot, grab his shirt front again and push him into the hole. All this happened lightning quick. As the door was closing in his face, he said, but I'll have to walk all the way across town. I yelled through the door, you should have thought about that before you got out of the damn car. I never saw him again, but a few weeks later there was a knock at my door. I answered. It was a local man with cerebral palsy flanked by two of his buddies. He told me he wanted to take me out for a really nice dinner and to buy me a bottle of champagne. The champagne comment was so random and specific that it kept spinning in the back of my head. I told him no, that I do not date strangers, and I thought it was bizarre he was doing this. As they turned to go, the pieces fell into place, and I said, wait a minute, were you told to come here by a short, red-headed guy? He confirmed that that was the case, and all these years later, I believe the guy was told by the other guy that I was a prostitute, and that bottle of champagne was my code phrase for customers. Such a nasty little creep. I work the night shift at a hotel, so I've had a ton of weirdos come through, but this is the most recent. Everything started off normally. Usually once I clock in at 11pm, I can just sit at the desk and only see a few people. I'm a loner, and I prefer it this way. Anyways, about 2.30 in the morning, a guy in his 30s comes down and stands in front of me at the desk. I worked this job for 5 years, so I can pick out the weirdos pretty well. I knew right away something was off about him. He didn't say anything at first, just stared at me, so I asked, Can I help you? He mumbled something. All I can make out is the word, coffee. I tell him there's fresh coffee available in the breakfast area behind him. He turns to look and then looks back at me, confused. Do you have some coffee I can take back to my room? My first thought is, this guy is drunk as hell and I told him he could take a cup of the already made coffee, or I could give him a couple packs to take to his room. He wanted the packs, so I grabbed a couple and gave them to him, hoping that's all he wanted, and I could go back to watching TV. No such luck. He kept standing in front of me, looking at the packets of coffee, confused. I've had enough of drunk guy, so I walk over to the other side of the desk and stare at the TV, ignoring him. After a few minutes, he wanders into the breakfast area and stares at the pots of coffee. Then he wanders over to the fruit, the cereal, yogurt, back to the coffee, just staring at everything and walking in slow circles. After a while of that, he stops looking at the food and looks at the ground, then starts muttering to himself while he's walking in circles. Now he's officially freaking me out. He's at least six inches taller than me and 50 pounds heavier and I'm the only one on shift. 
I start thinking of escape options, like locking myself in the laundry room, running to the gas station next door, and that kind of thing. I've had to do it a few times when things have gotten really bad, so I try to plan ahead when someone's giving me bad vibes. About 15 minutes after he starts walking in circles, he heads down the hall, still muttering to himself. I relax, happy he's gone to bed to pass out, and I'll have the lobby to myself again. Probably five minutes later, I glance out the front doors and he's there, staring at me, smoking a cigarette, and still talking to himself. I'm starting to think he's high on drugs, and that scares me enough to grab a pair of scissors when he's not looking and hold them down by my side. I start to think about calling the police, but what for? He hasn't done anything, so I decide to wait it out and hope he goes to bed soon. It was after 3am at that point. For the next 30 minutes, he walks up and down the halls, through the lobby and outside, then comes back in through the back door and loops around again. The third time he walks by me, still talking, I was terrified and was on the verge of saying screw it, calling 911 anyway just to have someone else there with me. Just then, an old woman walks up to the desk and asks me to call her a cab. She has no idea how happy I was to see her. I call for her and just start chatting to her to keep her in the lobby. The weirdo comes around the corner for the fourth time and the old woman tells him to pack up his stuff. They're leaving because he woke her up and she couldn't go back to sleep. Apparently this old lady is the weird guy's mom. I felt much better knowing he was going to leave as soon as the cab got there. As soon as she told him to pack up his stuff, he gets angry. He did not want to leave. He told her to go back to bed, but she was very adamant, and after they argued for a bit, he goes upstairs to pack. She explained to me she could tell he was getting agitated, and it was time to take him home. I talked to her for a while, and she opened up to me. She told me her son is a schizophrenic, and she's the only one who would take care of him. She told me she just wished someone would take him for six months like a hospital, to get him on medication and into a good routine. I felt so awful for her. She seemed so tired and hopeless. I have mental issues myself, so I could relate to the struggle. All of a sudden the weird guy comes running out, demanding to stay, and they argue again. Except this time, he seemed to be watching and focused on me, storming up to the desk and screaming, She's gonna call the cops, I didn't do anything. Are you going to clean my kitchen? Why aren't you sucking my dick yet? Amongst other horrible things while I just stood there, stunned. I held up the scissors to defend myself and his mom screamed, Stop. Do you hear what you're saying to her? He calmed down just as he snapped. The cab pulled up and as much as I felt for his mom, I was happy to see them pull away. Back when I was 18 to 19 years old, I was house-sitting with the girl I was studying with. The family we were house-sitting for went to the same church as her, but I didn't really know them well myself. It was more to keep her company in a huge house. This was 1997, when the average teen like me didn't have a cell phone. During the week that we were house-sitting, it was a short break in the school calendar, which is why the family was away and why the streets in the area were quieter than usual. My apartment, as well as the house we sat for, was not far from the university. My apartment was actually a three minute walk from it, and the house a further five minutes by car. So being a student neighborhood, it was particularly quiet this week. The first weird thing that happened the week I was at this house was that I dreamed I was driving through a dark forest on a windy, hilly dirt road. There were no lights anywhere except for those from my car's headlights. As I started to go down a hill, the headlights suddenly cut out and everything went dark. The car slowed down to a stop and died. I then woke up. In the morning, I went out to my car and it wouldn't start. It had been working perfectly the day before. I had to call a guy to come fix it. It was the starter motor. 
Well, that was the first creepy thing that happened that week. A day or two later, it was Friday. I planned on driving back home to my parents, who lived in a smaller town about 45 minutes away. I packed up my stuff at the big house and was going to head over to my apartment to collect whatever else I needed for the weekend. That trip between the house and the apartment was, as I mentioned, only five minutes or so away. Since it was winter, it was dark by the time I left at around 7pm. As I was driving from the house, I noticed in my rearview mirror the headlights of a car behind me, tailing me really close. When I turned, it turned. Back then I was cautious, but not overly so, though cautious enough to notice in such a short distance that something weird was going on behind me. But then when I pulled up to a traffic light, it wasn't there anymore. I felt relief, but it was short-lived. The car was now beside me. I looked to my right and there was a man inside, alone, smiling at me, slightly maniacally. For a moment I thought, geez, I should really drive with a beanie on at night so people can't see I'm a petite five foot two female with long blonde hair down to my waist. I also thought, well, he's in the lane to turn right so I'm all good. I pulled off and the headlights were right behind me again, so close in fact I could barely see them over the back of my car. What an ass, I thought. Who drives like that? Thank God my turn is coming up on the left soon. After another minute or two of this tailgating, I slowed down, strategically didn't indicate, made a sudden sharp left into my driveway, opened the automatic gates and shot inside. The gates closed behind me. The drama was over, I thought to myself. I gathered a few things from the car to take up with me and noticed on my way over to the stairwell that there was a man at the gate that had just closed behind me. He was still on the other side and I was at the far end of the parking lot, but I could make out it was the guy from the tailgating car. He was jumping up and down, shaking the gate with absolute rage. Well, I was safely on one side, so I wasn't completely gripped with fear. And besides, there was a group of students making a noise nearby, arriving for a house party or something. I headed to the stairs and started going from the basement to ground level to the first floor. Rounding the stairs on the first floor, I noticed someone running across the parking lot towards the staircase. In hindsight, I can't fathom why I didn't put two and two together. I guess it was because I subconsciously knew that there was a group being let in through the pedestrian gate. As I was rounding the staircase between the second and third floors, someone suddenly touched me. I spun around, and it was the guy. He had slipped in as part of the small crowd. He said something. I said something sassy back and told him to fuck off. Then I turned my back on him to continue up the stairs. I live on the third and last floor. He grabbed me from behind, held my back against his chest with his left forearm around my neck. I felt something being held against my right side. Shit. It was a knife. He led me down. I remember thinking that the light was broken on the bottom level. This cannot end well. But I was calm. I resisted slightly. He tightened his grip. I felt like I wasn't getting enough oxygen. I started to become a dead weight. He started to drop on me. I was groin level, so I elbowed and it connected. He dropped me but spun around to face me, ripped the front of my button down top, and then he stopped. He looked at someone behind me, someone taller than him. His eyes went wide. He turned and then ran. I screamed. Then I turned around to see who had come to help me. There was no one there. People came out of their apartments after that. The police were called. This was the second time that they were there that night. It turns out the other weird thing that happened that night was my dad had already called the police and they'd come past an hour before. My mom had a weird feeling all evening and it hassled my dad endlessly that something bad was going to happen to me. She had been right. 
As it turned out, they caught the guy. I identified him in a lineup. It turned out that this guy had a record of sexual assault. One of the victims had thrown herself out of the first floor of her apartment to get away from him, and she'd broken her leg. Weeks later, the police called me. Before his trial, his cell door had been left open. He was gone. It was apparently an inside job. I went to a college that was integrated into a big city, so even though there was a campus, there were plenty of shops, back streets, public transport, and just regular people walking around. So I was part of a club that went late into the night. I usually only stayed till 9 to 9.30 p.m. and would then leave. The club was in the center of the campus while I lived east of it. It was about a 15 to 20 minute walk. This was a foggy late fall to early winter night. My friend had left early because they weren't feeling well. I ended up staying late and began my walk close to 10.30pm. So I started walking down a back street that was quiet, but led right to my door. It was after a few minutes that I heard footsteps somewhere behind me. I stopped, thinking it was a jogger, and moved aside to let them pass but then I noticed that there was no one coming, and the footsteps had stopped. I shrugged and started walking. The footsteps started up again. I stopped, and then they stopped again. I started to get a bad gut feeling and quickly walked to a side street that connected the back street to the bigger main street. This street had a lot of lights, plenty of cars, and still a good number of people on it. I walked back to my dorm from there. The next morning I woke up and checked my emails. One was from the campus alert system. Apparently an hour after I got back to the dorm, someone was stabbed on the back street. The victim was rushed to the hospital and survived, saying that the perpetrator followed them down the back street before stabbing them. The perpetrator never got caught, but I have no doubt that that was the person who tried to follow me. I'm so glad I trusted my gut. After that, I made sure to never stay at the club past 9.30 and to always leave with someone who was at least walking in the same direction as me. My ex and I moved to a new area closer to our workplaces which happened to be in a very bad neighborhood. We were young and just really needed a cheap apartment. We didn't know how truly dangerous the neighborhood was. She had an early morning meeting for work and needed to fill her car up with gas. When we first moved to that neighborhood, I noticed a few blocks away that there was a gas station that looked extremely sketchy. I even made a point to say we probably should go somewhere else to get gas even though it is the closest one to our apartment. When she pulled in, she was the only car there and she began to pump her gas. While she's filling up, she sees two men walk out of the gas station mini-mart and when they see her, they both immediately turn around and go back into the mart. She thought that was strange and continued pumping. A few moments go by and the men came back out and walked straight to her. They start chatting with her, asking where she's going and if she wants to go to a party. She reminds them that it's 6am and they just laugh and continue to try and persuade her. The position they decided to stand really made her uncomfortable. They positioned themselves in a way where they had either side of her and she felt like she wouldn't have been able to jump in her car if she needed to get away quickly. All of a sudden, another car pulls in to get gas and the two men just sprint away, as if they had already committed a crime. I still wonder what would have happened if that car never pulled in. So for the record, I just want to say my son is alive and happy now. I find this odd and creepy, 
and I'm still looking for explanations a year later. I was 22 when I got pregnant with my 10-month-old son. I'm very close to my husband, but not in contact with my parents. As a result, I was feeling scared. There are some things you simply need a mom for, and a first pregnancy is one of them. So I grew closer to M, a 25-year-old friend of mine who was out of work for reasons she didn't say. Before then, she was a nanny, and she thought herself to be quite the expert. I stayed at home due to a difficult pregnancy, and I would text her during the day. The first red flag, looking back on it, was probably when she said, I knew it, when I told her I was pregnant. I guess this can be something people say, but then she said, I had a vision. I simply felt it in the air that someone was pregnant. Okay, I thought. A bit odd, but maybe M was just a bit eccentric. I should also say that my husband did not like me talking to M. He's usually a laid-back, carefree person, but he was adamant about this. M apparently dated my husband's best friend, Edward, and came out about horrid instances of abuse after dumping him quite abruptly. Maybe this did happen, I told my husband, who was annoyed I wouldn't take him at face value. As an abuse victim myself, I like to believe other victims. Looking back, I wish I had listened to him. Anyway, I told M that I wasn't speaking to my family and that I felt alone. Again, I was pregnant, sick, and vulnerable. Okay, she said. Thanks for telling me. You know, family isn't always blood. I can be family for you. I can be there for you. I can throw you a baby shower and help out. Hey, I even have experience as a doula, so I can help you along the way. Even though it was not that long ago, I was really naive. I also was really, really lonely without a mom, so I agreed. Soon M began showering me with gifts. Crackers I could eat, ginger candies for the nausea, religious baby CDs, stretch mark cream. Some of this seemed a bit too personal for me at the time, but I figured, hey, it's the thought that counts. The first trimester was bad, and my OB wasn't taking me seriously. When I told them I was extremely nauseous and couldn't get out of bed, they told me they couldn't prescribe me anything. They told me I would have to go to my primary care doctor for medicine, and I guess I was so exhausted, I didn't feel like jumping through too many hoops. That's okay, M said. In my training, I have learned that there are some drugs that are awaiting FDA approval, but they help nausea like this and worked for my previous patient. She gave me these deterra pills. I looked them up and found they were mostly snake oil, and a part of what I now realize is a pyramid scheme. M vouched for them and said they were a more holistic approach, and fuck was my nausea bad. So the following morning I took them, and immediately and violently threw up. I told her and she said, Keep forcing them in your body until it takes, okay? I called my husband about this, who was pretty pissed off. Em had come over while he was at work, and he wasn't entirely aware all this was going on. So I texted Em and asked her to tell me more about a formal doula training, to which she said she had none, and the previous patient she'd been talking about was her sister. I've looked at videos and read up on things, she said, as vague as ever, but it's truly God's calling for me. Stay by me, and I would love to continue to help you. From then on, I was more cautious about M. I asked her why she was out of work, and she told me she had an invisible illness. When I asked her more about the specifics, she told me that her bones were wobbly and her muscles wouldn't stop working. She said it couldn't be diagnosed and that the doctors didn't believe her. The one diagnosis she gave me was fibromyalgia, which I have heard is painful, but I wasn't sure if this was accounting for her being out of work, as she said. My mom had fibromyalgia, but as I said, I'm not in contact with her. To this day, I don't know if M was really in that much pain, but who am I to say? My point is, though, that it all felt off. I invited M to a friend's giving we were having around the holidays, and a friend approached me, shaking. 
She's talking about your abuse, my friend said. She says she's helping you through it and how you were going nowhere when she met you. I continued to host the party and eat chips and confronted Em about it after the party, and she completely denied it. The only problem was the friend who had told me had never met Em before. She was saying things only M could say, so I kept my distance. I had a group chat on Facebook Messenger with close friends where I gave little updates on how the baby was doing, the gender, the name, that kind of thing, and she was still a part of this. If I had sciatic nerve pain, she had sciatic nerve pain. When I talked about my back hurting and nausea, she had the exact same thing. Finally, she told me, you're not handicapped like me. You're pregnant. These updates you're giving me are offensive. So I removed her from the chat. Most of my friends were happy to hear the updates anyway. I informed my friends that my kid's middle name is Fox. People started talking about the name and would comment on my statuses with things like, so excited to see the little Fox. M backed off a bit, and apparently, as she briefly mentioned, was in a mental hospital for some time. I didn't know if this was true. I didn't know if anything was true about her at this point. Time passes, and in mid-spring, she came by again. I had time to cool off and was well into the second trimester and feeling a bit better. She brought by beautiful baby clothes, which I was thrilled about initially, and also snacks, which are always needed. Upon looking at the clothes, I saw most of them had lions on them. How sweet, I said. Yeah, she replied. For our little lion pup. I laughed at this, but got a sinking feeling as soon as I opened the card from her. It read, For the little lion. Capitalized like Fox in his name. At this point, I was beginning to feel a bit strange. My husband actually got home around the time that she was there, and being his chill self, he tried to play it off. She was openly hostile and said things like, Good fucking luck using cloth diapers. You all will learn how to parent right eventually. You obviously haven't been parents before. All these hurtful things. Her husband came by to pick her up and swooped me into a big hug. This surprised me, as Em initially told me her husband had autism. She said he didn't like to touch people or be around them, and he didn't like me. He took her home and my husband and I decided together that that was enough for M. She was still invited to my baby shower in June. Time passed as it does and I grew bigger. I was on my bed rest monitoring my contractions and using crutches for sciatic nerve pain. My baby shower was sort of my last hurrah before giving birth. The night before I got a text from M. How could you, she said. What? I replied. After a bit of prompting, she says, You got a pack and play. Yeah, I replied. You got a pack and play when I got you a bassinet as a gift. Let me just say that the bassinet was not on my registry, but a pack and play was. My grandmother had given me money for one as she couldn't come to the shower. This is what M said to me. I am mad you got yourself a pack and play. I got you a bassinet as your gift. A pack and play makes no sense. You don't understand and you didn't take my advice. You screwed yourself over and I'm confused by your decisions. How could you get a pack and play before your shower? They don't even work as a bed. They work as a playpen and infants use those. You are wrong if you think infants don't play. Why are you doing this? I tried discussing safe sleep with you and feel personally negative about what you did. I am so anxious. For some reason, I took her at face value and answered her as calmly as possible. She continued to say that my idea was poorly researched and simply a bad product. A bad product was what got me. I was about to have a baby, and I was putting a lot of work into already being the best mom I could be. I was also monitoring my stress because again, I was highly pregnant. I snapped and said, Honestly, I am the mom. I'm making the decisions. If you cannot accept that, I'm sorry. And then she says it. The thing she must have been thinking for some time. Just because you're the mom 
doesn't mean all the decisions are yours. Actually, I said, it does. I'm shaking, Jane, she said. She then begins to send me some nonsensical text messages, and eventually I stop following. My phone blows up for the rest of the night, and I turn it off. She did come to the shower, but close friends had heard about the situation, and she was treated like a pariah. She gave me the bassinet, decorated entirely with lions, as well as a musty box full of old clothes and hairbands. One onesie read, loved by my dead grandmother in heaven. I'm still confused about that. That's the last I see of her, and I would like to say the last I heard of her, but it's not. This past year, she texted me and told me she was getting a divorce, and just to be there for her out of solidarity. Apparently, she was devastated. However, we saw her ex-husband at a mutual friend's party, and he told everyone that while he was leaving her, her verbal abuse got too much to bear, so he ended it. He also said that she was having delusions and was hostile about things that did not happen. We asked him with caution. If he was autistic, he said that he wasn't. He even went to three doctors to get himself checked out due to her accusations, and all three said he was not. We've since gotten closer to my husband's friend Edward, as well as his wife and child. When we told him all of this, he said, Yeah, I don't go on about it, but I in fact did pick her up from a mental hospital once. She is bipolar and schizophrenic but I can't even be sure about that. In light of telling this story, I looked at her Facebook. Another one of her friends is pregnant, and I saw her post. I love my friend's children like they were my own. So, pregnant friend of hers, God help you, and don't take those doTERRA pills. Back in the 8th grade, probably halfway through the school year, I received a phone call from an unknown caller. Usually, I would not answer for a number I didn't recognize, or sometimes I would do so in an accent, but I would always hang up after a second or two. Things changed, however, when the second I answered, I heard a man say my full name in a questioning tone, like if he was asking for confirmation that it was me. Being just a kid, then thinking this was one of my parents, or someone who I could talk to, I told him that it was me. Big mistake, but I didn't know that at the time. The first phone call I don't remember much of, except that he hung up not long after I said it was me. Then some time passed, maybe less than a week, when I get an unknown call again. I didn't answer, and then I kept getting spam calls. So I finally answered and this guy was asking me about what shows I like to watch. I got the idea that maybe I shouldn't be talking to this guy, so I just hung up. Not much longer, another couple of calls came in until I said stop calling me, and he responded something to the effect of, hanging up mid-conversation is rude. My dad heard me and asked who I was talking to. So I told him that I didn't know and handed him the phone. My dad asked who it was and to stop calling my number in his angry dad tone. Then he got a confused face for a second, before getting really angry and shouting at them, before they abruptly hung up. My dad later told me that this person knew his name, Carlos, and had said to him, Don't be so angry, Carlos, before hanging up. Pretty soon, these calls would happen at least once a day, and I would almost always hand the phone to my dad for him to yell at the guy. We told all of our friends and family to stop if they were prank calling me. We tried getting the police involved, and we also contacted my middle school, saying there was a guy being creepy with me. The guy never called during school hours, and he usually would call at first when I was at home alone but then soon switched it up to calling around the time my father got home from work. This guy sounded young. For a long time, we thought my uncles or their friends were playing pranks on us. He sounded mid to late twenties, and sounded sort of Latino. He never had an angry tone, and never said anything malicious. 
but he was a stalker, and he knew the names of my parents, sisters, my dogs, some cousins, and my grandparents. He never called when we had company over, and it was never after 8pm. At one point I was sitting in my room and got a call, but this point it was nearing the last few weeks of school, and because this guy never said anything bad, and police said there was nothing to do, I just answered the phone and asked what he wanted. I remember, clear as day, he was listing off video games. Red Dead Redemption, Modern Warfare 2, Halo 3, and he went on for a bit. I looked over to my disc stand, and I saw he was reading off the list in order that my games were, top to bottom. I stood up and looked out the window, but nobody was there. After the list was done, I just stood there, and he told me something about me having good taste in games, and that we should play sometime. At this moment I was scared shitless. I cried and called my dad. He came home early, and we realized like idiots that we could just change my number. We changed my number and I purged my Facebook accounts, and we all set our accounts to private. Maybe six months later, we moved, and after changing the number, I never got any calls from this guy again. The reason I came to tell this story is because I've been getting unknown numbers calling me for the past couple of days, and I never answer them anymore. But telling my girlfriend about it, she reminded me about the guy. So I will be changing my number again soon as a precaution. In 2018, I moved to a bigger city in another country, and I got accustomed to public transport pretty fast. This city is in Europe and actually known to be one of the safer places. At the time I took a public bus to school every morning around 7am or 8am. My younger brother's school was also on the same route. He got off a few stations ahead of me, but I would often take him to school and pick him up on my way back, since he was only 8 years old at the time. I was 15 then. This routine went on for a year, and at some point, while taking the bus at the same time every morning, I know the faces of people I see almost every morning on the bus. I gradually started to notice a man stare at my brother and me. He was probably in his later 20s or even early 30s. He was pretty short, skinny, glasses and a bit of a beard. After some time he would smile while looking at us, and I justified this to myself as him thinking how we were a cute pair of siblings or something. Despite that, his staring got more intense after a while, and it was not discreet at all. He started getting off at the same station as me, where my school was. Fortunately, there are a few different schools in the area, so he couldn't know for sure which one was mine. Well, at least I hope. One day I was late for class because my younger brother missed his station, so I took him to school and barely managed to catch the next bus running for it. I got on the bus, short of breath, but still happy that I made it. I sit down by the window, right by the door. I look to my side since I felt a stare, and there he was again, standing despite many empty seats, staring at me trying to catch my breath. I turn my head to the front again, trying to pretend I didn't notice him. I got off one stop before in case the bus got stuck on the busy intersection ahead and I started to walk to school through a shortcut. Because I was in a hurry, I didn't notice he got off behind me as well. He probably walked behind me for about a hundred meters before realizing I didn't notice him and he decided to approach me. He creepily peeked at my right side, starting to walk pretty close next to me. He greeted me and I awkwardly stepped away while walking ahead at the same pace. He said, We saw each other a few times on the bus ride. I answered with something along the lines of, No, sorry, I don't know you. He then started asking some pretty creepy questions like, You're in high school, aren't you? Where's your brother today? He wasn't with you. That is your brother, right? 
I was flustered, so I just uttered a similar sentence again. Sorry, I don't know you. He then made a ridiculous remark how he doesn't know me either. So you don't want to talk. He continued following me very near my school, but after realizing that it was also more crowded in that part of the city, he gave up and made his way through one of the alleys, separating from me. I sighed out of relief and told a few of my classmates what happened. They were pretty angry at him, so they told me to call them to wait in front of the school in case this happens again. I stopped seeing him on the bus for some time after that, which made me think it wasn't his actual bus, and he's just there to stare at young girls. After the pandemic calmed down, I started noticing him again, but I don't think he recognized me. I now wear glasses, I lost some weight, and I also wear more makeup than before. He even stood next to me a few times, but I am taller than him so I guess I'm not worthy at staring at anymore. He still stares at the girls on the bus. I've gained some confidence to be the one catching him staring at the thighs of these girls, and then staring him down in disgust. He often looks down after he notices me. I wish I had some sort of evidence to report him, but he never actually touches anybody. Thank God. I wish I could say, Let's not meet again, but I still see him on the bus. But I am now older and able to spot a predator when I see one. A few years ago, I lived at a party house, and one night a friend brought home some guy off the AT. He called himself Chef John Wayne. He was honestly really, really sweet. We let him stay with us for a couple of months. He helped cook and clean, slept in the corner of the living room and didn't make trouble. Well, one weekend I went out of town for a couple of nights, but I'd come back the next day to work. When I got to the house, I realized my laptop was missing and Chef's stuff was gone. Everyone else I'd lived with had gone to the event I'd just been at, except for one guy, Greg, and Chef. I went to Greg and explained that I couldn't find my laptop, and his face was just shocked. He said, You don't know. They didn't call you. I explained that I'd been out of cell service for two days, so no. He then went on to tell me that the police had come to the house the previous night, looking for me specifically. He went on to tell me that the police had found Chef downtown, bare-ass naked with my laptop in two halves doing snow angels in a puddle of mud. Why he was doing this I never found out. Drugs probably, but who knows. The reason the police had come looking for me, however, was that while he was doing said snow angels, he was apparently screaming, I hurt Megan, over and over. They'd come to the house looking for my dead body, but the poor guy was probably talking about the laptop the whole time. Regardless, when I wasn't home, I'm sure it looked very suspicious. Anyway, I decided that the easiest thing to do was go to the station the next day and talk with them. I was questioned a bit and told them I thought Chef was a good guy, that I'd never seen him do anything like that before, and that I was not pressing charges. The weird part of this story is actually what happened after this. I was very upset about losing the laptop because I'd been using one from school I attended and needed to return it or prove that it had been damaged and that I hadn't sold it. I explained this to my roommates, but not to the police. It worked out with the school. I moved out of the house a few months later because I decided it was too crazy. But a few weeks after I moved out, I went over to visit. Lo and behold, the two halves of my laptop were hanging on the wall like fine art. Apparently someone had dropped it off in a brown paper bag in the dead of night, and they wanted to commemorate Chef and his antics. I was thrilled and let them keep it. I never found out who dropped it off. Chef contacted me after he got out of psychiatric holding. He said he was moving on. I didn't respond, but I wish I did in retrospect. I just hope he is doing well.
For a bit of background, I'm a 20-year-old short petite female working at Subway, and I can't help but be nice to anyone, even if they creep me out. I feel bad usually. About a year ago, we had this guy, 30 to 40 years old, who would come in every day for lunch. He was fascinated by my stretched ears and few piercings I had on my face. He would always ask questions. He would sit down after I rang him out and watch me from his table for two hours, non-stop, just staring at me while I helped other customers. This goes on for about two weeks. Every day he would ask for my number, saying he has plugs and tunnels he wants to give me, that he wants to see me wearing them in my ears. I always politely declined. One day, I'm alone in the store because my manager had to run to the bank. We were really slow that day, so I just went into the back room messing around on my phone. I heard the door chime. I looked up, and yet no one was there. Then I saw the man walk past the front of the store really quickly, kinda like he was in a hurry. The store phone rings. Thanks for calling Subway. How can I help you? This is the girl with the nice ears, right? Uh, yes? Who is this? Are you alone in the back room right now? Are you working by yourself? At this point I really got creeped out, and I knew it was him. I hung up and messaged my manager the situation, so she would hurry back. He called again, this time asking me very weird questions like what I would do with him in a room with the door locked, if I had a boyfriend, why I was playing hard to get, all those weird, creepy things. My manager gets back and I tell her everything. In the middle of the lunch rush, he calls again. This time my manager answers, and to this day, she never told me what he said, but the look on her face made my spine shiver. She told him if he called again, or showed up here, she would call the police. I thought that was the end of it, but alas, I was wrong. One week later, I'm clocking out and getting ready to walk to my car parked in the front, and when I look outside, I see him standing by my car and looking inside of it. I was an idiot and left the back door unlocked. I watched him crawl inside, and then he shut the door. The creep was trying to hide in my fucking back seat and do God knows what to me when I got in. My manager locked the front door of our store and called the police. When they arrived, they had to pretty much drag him out of my car and he was promptly arrested. On him was a butcher knife, rope, and a rag with chloroform on it. If I hadn't looked up when I did, I would probably be dead right now. I used to live in a townhouse by myself with my dog and two cats near a train station. There were often commuters who parked outside of my place and passed by through the day and night. Occasionally I had cigarettes or stuff stolen from my front veranda. I even had my next door neighbor's ex-boyfriend come to my door, telling me he had a hitman after him and he had a gun. But none of this scared me like the night I was watched. My dog lives indoors and I would take him out to use the bathroom one last time before bed. My backyard light was broken and was too high up to change the light bulb, so I always took him out to the front. That night it was around 11pm and I took him out to the front. It was a hot summer night and I was mindlessly standing on the footpath when I saw movement across the road from me. Out of nowhere a man had appeared and was walking diagonally across the street away from me. I thought it was odd because I hadn't seen him come from the other direction. I continued to think about it. Where he came from was outside a house that was being renovated. I knew the owners weren't living there and thought maybe he was going to try to steal stuff. So I kept looking down the road to where he had gone. He had turned the corner down the next street. I kept watching him, and then I suddenly see his head pop up from around the corner to see if I'm still outside. This gives me the absolute creeps, so I grab my dog and go inside. 
I turn off all my lights and go upstairs to my bedroom, which is at the front of the townhouse and faces the street. I thought I would keep watch over my neighbor's house and call the police if he came back. I peer through my blinds, which cover sliding doors coming off a small balcony, and like clockwork, I see a dark figure walk down from the corner and down my street. He's moving towards the house across the road, and then I suddenly lose sight of him. A tree in front of my townhouse obscures my view for a moment, and then he's there. He's not just there, he's stopped at the top of my driveway. He's standing there like fucking Jason Voorhees. I kid you not, his arms were out by his sides and his legs apart in an unnatural stance. It was like he was preparing for something, like he wanted to come and kill me. My heart was racing so hard I could barely hear. I'm standing there slack-jawed looking at this would-be assailant when one of my cats comes to see what's happening. My cat slides his body between the blinds and window, further opening it, and I see this person, this man looking up toward me. I'm thinking surely he sees me. If he does, this does not stop him. He starts walking down my driveway, undeterred and fixated. I lose sight of him under the balcony and awning. By this time, my eyes are watering in fear, and tears are streaming down my face. I don't know what to do. I go and sit on my bed. I pick up my phone and dial my dad, who lives a suburb away. He answers. I whisper to him what's happening, and he says he'll be there as soon as he can. I lie down in my bed and lie still as I can, tears rolling down my cheeks. Pure fear, not knowing what this man was doing downstairs, and if he could get in. What if I hadn't locked the doors, and then it dawned on me why I'm lying here in the dark crying. Turn on a light. So I did. What seemed like a lifetime, but was probably just a couple of minutes later, my dad arrived. He had an umbrella with him. I stayed on the phone with my dad while he searched the outside for the man. The man was gone. Maybe me turning on the lights scared him off. I called the police, who said I should have called sooner. Of course I should have. I don't know why I didn't. They came out with a sniffer dog and didn't find him either. I don't know what he wanted, but for a good year after that, I was so scared living there. I'm still scared, but reading other stories makes me realize I'm not alone, and we can all learn from these experiences. I know what to do if something scary happens. At the time of this story, I was 17 years old and had just graduated high school. I was one of the youngest in my class due to my birthday being in late summer. Anyway, it's about the middle of June and I've got nothing to do. Skype was really popular at this time, so I'd added some school friends along with some teachers who were all pretty cool. Our school policy doesn't allow students and teachers to be connected on social media, so once I graduated, it was all okay. One of the teachers I added wasn't really a teacher, he was a teacher's assistant. He was relatively new to the school, he'd only been there about two years, but long enough that everyone trusted him. One day as I'm chatting up a few people, he sends me a message telling me that our drama club was going to have some sort of graduation party out at a lake nearby. He told me that a bunch of people I knew, along with some members of his family, would be there. As I said previously, I was 17, very naive, so I agreed to go. It sounded like fun and I didn't have any other plans. Unfortunately, my family is pretty poor, so we didn't have the gas money to drive to the lake. So, like an idiot, I let Mr. Mary pick me up. Not even 10 minutes down the road, he turns to me and says, You're 18, right? I answered that no, my birthday wasn't for another couple of weeks. He sort of looked forward and got quiet, but he kept on driving. It weirded me out a bit, but I figured, what could go wrong? The others will be there waiting for me. So, 
Half an hour later and we pull up to the lake, in a very secluded part. I start feeling weird and notice that we're literally the only people around. He grabs me by my hand and starts walking towards a little lakeside restaurant where he orders us some food. The entire time he's rubbing my arm on my back, trying to hold my hand, pushing hair out of my face, and I'm just fucking terrified. I had the bright idea to ask a restaurant worker where the restroom was, because for some reason I didn't think to let them know what was happening. I walk outside and lock myself in the restroom while frantically trying to get a hold of someone, anyone, but I had no cell phone service, not even a hint. So I'm freaking out, almost in tears, when I manage to get one tiny bar of service and text my stepmother. She really saved my life that day. Mr. Mary and I walk back out to his car, and once inside, luckily with a little better service, my stepmother calls me and makes a huge scene about a bad emergency happening and needing me home right then. Luckily, this must have scared him because he drove me back home where he was met with my very, very pissed off set of parents. My dad and my stepmom reported him to both the cops and the school system, but nothing was ever done about it. I'm not sure if he's still part of the school or not. All I know is he sent me a friend request on Facebook a couple of years back, and I promptly blocked him. This happened some years ago. I had just started working at a university hospital in the US as a nursing care tech. At the time I was planning on going to nursing school, I thought working in a hospital would be a great starting place for experience and it would give me a better chance at getting into nursing school at that university. Anyway, I was always a very outgoing and friendly person and I'm not a stranger to anyone. I had no issues making new friends at my job. I worked day shift, 7am to 7.30pm, 3 days a week. Our shift always overlapped with night shift in order to give them a full report about the patients that they would be caring for that evening. Sometimes I would have to give a report to a night shift employee by the name of Mark. Mark was always funny and outgoing, and we seemed to hit it off pretty well. I was dating someone at the time, and Mark was married but I always felt like he was just a cool friend to hang out with. We'd previously discussed stories of going out to bars. One night when I was getting off of work, I had mentioned I was planning on going out to a bar next night with a group of friends, and I invited him along. He was more than happy to join us. The entire time we were out there, we had a great time and hit it off with everyone. Despite him not knowing anyone in my friends group, he never blatantly hit on me or gave any indication he was attracted to me. I just saw him as a friend and it had always felt that way, and I felt the feeling was mutual with him. I arrived home at around 2am and woke up maybe 9 or 10am. I checked my phone to find an unreasonable amount of text messages from an unknown number. This was several years ago and I no longer have the messages, but it was something along the lines of, I know you went out with my husband last night. I know you have a boyfriend, but you must be attracted to my husband. Otherwise, why else would you invite him out to a bar without my presence and without your boyfriend? I know my husband is attractive, and I don't always appreciate him going out with other women. Blah, blah, blah. I don't remember the next four paragraphs she sent me, but the one that stuck out was when she asked, So, are you a team player with a winky face? I kindly informed her that I do have a trusting boyfriend who did not mind if I went out with male friends, and I was in no way attracted to her husband. I also told her that while I understand and respect that they have an open relationship, I am not interested in experimenting with couples. I prefer my relationships to be monogamous. She was completely understanding and even offered to meet up for drinks with her and her husband in the future. Now I don't care if my friend is a swinger, it's not my personal lifestyle, but hey, I don't judge. I was willing to forget the whole ordeal and look past it. Big mistake. 
Myself and Mark made plans to go on a double date with my boyfriend and his wife, Helen, at a dance club. All was well and we all had a lot of fun bar hopping and dancing. She seemed cool enough and I learned she was a school teacher in a neighboring town. By the end of the evening, we all had our friendly goodbyes and retreated home. Again, the next morning, I woke up to a whole new set of a million text messages sent from his wife. This time, not so friendly. She was upset and went off on me, claiming that I was a homewrecker and that I destroyed their marriage. She claimed that I had grabbed his hand on the way to the dance floor and put his hand on my ass, then claimed I grabbed his ass and then changed her story a third time and claimed I grabbed his ass. I kindly explained to her that none of these events even occurred. She said I obviously didn't remember any of it because I was too drunk to remember, and she said my boyfriend had to carry me out of the bar. Now, I had only two drinks over the three hours we were out. I was never drunk or blackout, as she had put it. I'd left the bar walking on my own with my boyfriend at the time, I had myself a good night's sleep that night. Either way, she wasn't having my side of the story. I decided to let it go and stop trying to convince her otherwise, and I was planning on having a talk with Mark regarding the misconstrued issue. The next day, she posted on Facebook about a marriage was wrecked because of me, and she said she was going to show up at my house and settle it. She also said she never slept and hadn't slept in days, and it was all my fault and she placed the blame for her failing marriage on me. The words she used describing how she was going to settle it weren't so kind or mature. She had no idea where I lived, so I wasn't too worried about it. She told everyone about how she planned on pressing charges against me for touching her husband that night. A few hours later, and she left me another voicemail sobbing and apologizing to me telling me how horrible Mark was and how he's a jerk and really mean to her, and she told me she was sorry he ever got in the way of our friendship, and she would never allow him to interfere with our friendship ever again. I hardly knew her, and had only met her in person once. I promptly deleted and blocked her on Facebook, and my boyfriend did as well. I never returned her calls, nor did I worry about having charges pressed, because that never happened and her husband agreed with me prior. Although I had stopped responding and ceased contact with her, the phone call started. She would call me all hours of the day, anywhere from 6am to midnight, but I never answered. It was really any time she was awake. I had no issues leaving my phone on silent, so I just ignored them, thinking she would give up. She lightened up after a few days. The next day I was at work, I decided to pull Mark aside into the storage room to have a talk with him privately because I didn't want co-workers to hear or get involved. I didn't think it was a big issue. I told him the issue I was having with his wife and he apologized about it. He told me he would have a word with her and told me he would get her to stop. Great. That was until he dropped a bombshell that would make all this make a bit more sense. Nearing the end of the conversation, he bluntly told me, Look, I'm sorry about everything that happened with her, but I have to be honest with you. I want to sleep with you. I told my wife I wanted to. She had an affair a few years ago, and recently I just wanted some strange. She wasn't okay with it at first, but she said if it was a threesome, she'd be willing to settle with that. Initially, she was alright with it, but as time passed since I told her that, she's got upset about it. I'm sorry she's been so crazy. I was a bit stunned, but it made everything come together a bit about why she's been so upset. I told him I wasn't interested in him, and I also told him I didn't want to go out with him alone anymore, and I didn't want any more double dates, and that was that. Fast forward a week or so, and everything had calmed down. I thought it was over, and I was beginning to forget about the whole ordeal. One night I was in bed, about to go to sleep, until I got a text message from a number I didn't know. All it said was, What's up? I asked who it was, and they completely avoided the question. More messages followed that said, I miss you. Where are you living now? Can I come by? Hey girl, wanna hang out tonight? We haven't seen each other in forever, and it's been too long. Let me come over tonight. 
and let's have a drink and catch up. I'm on Winchester Road, coming into town, and I heard you live around here. Where are you? I can stop by on my way into town. Hey girl, I miss you and I love you. XOXO, when are we gonna see each other? I stopped answering because they would never tell me who they were. The texting was constant and the calls were even worse. The calls would come in at 2am every 10-15 to minutes or so and they would not stop until about 8am. This went on for 3-4 to days. Around this same time, my boyfriend got a friend request from someone with no mutual friends. She had messaged him privately over Facebook along with this request. She explained she was a new nursing student coming to the university we went to, and she was on Facebook to make new friends before she moved here from Indiana. She was researching students at her university in order to make friends before she arrived. He thought it was innocent enough. My boyfriend was Middle Eastern and did not have a common first or last name whatsoever. He also had nothing to do with the College of Nursing at the university. He added her and they had casual conversations over Facebook about similar interests and hobbies, sports, and fun places to go around in town. All was fine until she started asking him inappropriate questions like, What's your girlfriend like? Do you think I'm pretty? I think I'm prettier than her. I don't remember what else she sent him, but eventually they turned into sexual advances. My boyfriend wasn't comfortable with it at all and considered blocking her. He let me read it because he wasn't sure what to do. I read through all of the messages and the first thing out of my mouth was, That's Helen. He did not believe me at first, but the way she had described herself and her interests were exactly like her. Once I explained all of this to him, he was convinced. She had made a fake profile with fake friends, which she had made in order for it to look real, and she even used Facebook pictures of one of her relatives. He confronted her about it, and she completely lost it. She started cursing at him, threatening him, telling him how she has no idea who it is he's talking about. She went on a long rant about how her husband beats her and she's pregnant. Alan was never pregnant and Mark never beat her. He told her he was sorry she was in that position, and eventually just gave up and blocked her. Somehow she managed to get his Gmail and university email, and once she found that, the email started. Initially, the emails were threatening, then later moved to emails looking for sympathy for a maid of pregnancy and her abusive husband, and all the horrible things he did to her. Then it finally moved on to a confession about how she really was Helen, and that she was sorry. He never responded to any of them. But because he never sent a response to her apology email, along came once again another angry, threatening email. He did not respond to that one either. At this point, I'd had enough, and I was just worn out on the entire thing. It became exhausting, and I was so tired of dealing with it. A good friend of mine is an officer in our city, I called him and told him everything that was happening and how bad it was escalating. I showed him all the texts, emails, messages, and the phone calls. The first thing he did was call the number who'd been harassing me to have them stop. She admitted it was her and agreed to stop contact with me, but she told my friend that she'd be pressing charges against me for touching her husband. He explained to her that it's not possible. There's no such thing as pressing charges for molestation for grabbing a grown man's ass. She was displeased, but I think having an officer call her to cease contact with myself and my boyfriend was enough to make her stop. I never heard from her since. Months went by and everything finally went back to normal. I transferred to a different department within the hospital, so I would not have to work with Mark anymore. I never told anyone at work about it, but I did not wish to have any more contact with him. I was still on the same floor, despite being on a different unit. I passed through his hall one night, leaving work. He was off work that night, but I stopped in the nurse station to say hi and bye to some of the nurses I used to work with. There was a large note hanging in the nurse's station with the extension to security. I laughed about it and asked what in the world could have happened to need their extension in such large, bold letters. One nurse Nadia told me that apparently Mark had left his wife while she was at work. 
He packed up all of his belongings and moved to an apartment in town without any notice to her. He was planning on divorcing her. This did not settle well with Helen. For a few days, she came up to the unit he was working on, looking for him in order to confront him about it. She only showed up on his off days for a few days until she finally found him. She never told any of the staff who she was. She just kept coming around asking about him. They would just tell her he was off of work and she would leave. After 9 or 10 p.m., all visitors have to check in with security with a state-issued ID in order to enter the hospital. Helen had found an old pair of scrubs that belonged to Mark, and when she came up to the entrance, she told security that she'd left her badge at home and wasn't able to access the building because of it. Surprisingly, they just let her in. She went up to the unit he was working at and she began screaming, crying, and begging him to come home. One of the nurses called security because she was making a huge scene. When security arrived to escort her out, she threatened to end herself if he didn't come home. She ended up being admitted to the mental facility a few miles down the road. The staff had left a note up in case she showed up looking for him again. Several months later, he divorced her, graduated from nursing school, and moved back to Indiana once he found a nursing job from his hometown. I never heard from Mark or Helen again. Fast forward a year, I went out with my friend, Officer Walton, just to hang out and catch up. We hadn't seen each other in quite a while. He mentions out of the blue, you will never, ever guess who left a voicemail just a few days ago. Helen. I was dumbfounded. What the hell did she want? She still had his number for over a year. He'd only called her once, but I guess she kept it for over a year and a half. He let me listen to the voicemail. She told him she was trying to divorce Mark because he was abusive and she needed to serve him a restraining order. She told him I was helping her out with it. Fuck no, I wasn't. She said the courts had told her she needed to find an officer on her own in order to do so. My friend Officer Walton never called her back. He laughed and said it was highly unlikely she had a restraining order because once one is in place, the county finds their own employees to take care of the matter. They do not leave it to the victims to ask around and find an officer to take care of it for them. Regardless, he never called her back, and we never heard from her again. So, Helen, I don't want to deal with your shit. When I was younger, I met a man. He was my brother's friend and he started living with us after his parents had done some despicable things, and he was left practically alone and a minor still attending school. I was an annoying little sister then, seven years younger, but I remember him saying to my brother, I don't mind at all, she reminds me of mine. What really gets me about this story, this experience, was that somehow I didn't realize until a month ago how important these events to transpire just might be. For me, there's only two events that are unmistakably him, things that he did to me. The first being one night when I was coming down for a glass of water. I began by opening my heavy bedroom door and continued down the creaky hallway and stairs without at all being silent. Just as I got to the bottom platform, I saw him sitting at the computer. I looked at him, he looked at me, and I heard an old news report playing the arrest of his parents. I felt like I was invading his most private moment, a time where he was obviously emotional and raw. I felt horrible. I paused in that moment because it was such an awkward situation. I just wasn't sure how I was supposed to respond next. But in that moment, where I was in my own head, he must have closed the tap and reopened another. He had to have hit play, as I imagined it wouldn't have started on its own, and I heard moaning. He just stared at me, and I was even deeper in my head like, is this really happening? It must have been an accident. I finally got the sense in me to go back to my room. I can't remember if I ever told anyone at the time. I dismissed it as an accident. The second one happened just as I got out of school. I went up to my room to find my bubble black TV was missing. My brother took it all the time, either as his own perceived punishment 
or because he wanted to use it for whatever reason. So I started by storming into his room and demanding where it was. The prong in my screw-on cable cord was getting bad, and it was such a hassle to set up again and again. I was aggravated. He tells me he has no idea and he couldn't care less. So confused, I'm now wondering who else would take it. I'm not grounded. My brother doesn't have it. Could it be his friend? I go to his room and knock. He sounds pissy and I ask if he took it. Through the door he said he did, and going back to my aggravated state, I open it up to see it sitting on the ground, seemingly unused. I then angrily say, why did you take my TV? And before I know it, he's bum rushing me into the wall and lifts me higher up by the throat. I start yelling at him, yelling in general, trying to fight back, and my mom runs up the stairs and screams at him. She tells him to let go of me and get the fuck out as my brother comes out of his room with the most puzzled look on his face. What are you doing? He said. His friend then leaves and I can't remember him coming back and living with us after that. A while later, my brother moved to a new house in the same neighborhood and for years he would on and off allow that friend to stay with him. He felt bad for him. He thought he was given an unfair start in his life and wanted to help him. It was before or around this time, a man all in black would begin terrorizing me. It all started on All Hallows' Eve when I was in fifth grade. It's exhausting to go through all of this again, truthfully. It was something that apparently my mind tried to downplay, dismiss, and forget for a while. But recently in therapy, I was forced to really face it, to realize it was the origin of who I am today. So, I'm gonna try to briefly explain what happened to me without leaving out too many details. There was a knock on the door when I was home alone. It was the middle of the night and I grew up watching forensic files, law and order, SVU, that kind of thing. So I was just naturally like, oh yeah, I don't want to open this. But like all dumb characters in horror movies who die in the beginning, I did. I opened the door and no one was there. So I stepped out onto the porch to look and see if they were leaving because of the moment I had taken to decide, but there was no one there. At first I thought nothing of it, one of my brother's friends or something, but some time later I was sitting on the couch and from there I saw something dark flash past the kitchen window. It was quick, but I kept thinking, you know, it's probably just my brother or his friend playing a prank, or maybe it's just nothing. I had no idea, but I was definitely creeped out. As I sat there, I just had this feeling of being watched, like my senses were telling me something was off. But that didn't prepare me for when I looked up, and amidst the slight glow of the backyard, I saw the outline of a man in black standing in the window. In the case of fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, I froze. That was when I watched as he lightly knocked on the window and did a close finger wave like you would to a child. Then he just disappears. And to summarize what happened when my family came home, it was my brother, and they were more convinced it was a prank. There were more details surrounding these important events and what had transpired between them in my previous story. But what really matters is that it never really stopped after that. Anytime I was home alone, or it was late at night, he was there, dressed entirely head to toe in black. There were phone calls that started at some point, but they would only be silence or a quick breath. And even though I lived in a house of people, it seemed it only happened to me. My mom had picked up the silent phone calls, but they or she would hang up quickly and she'd assume nothing of it. Then, the next real event happened. I was again home alone. It was a Friday. I remember because my friends were at a school football game that I didn't have a ride for. Around that time, things have kind of slowed down with the man. It seemed like he was coming around and just staring at my house from the backyard far less often, so I was actually feeling pretty relaxed at the time, considering everything. I was watching the TV show House, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a dark, sudden flash. My stomach dropped. My heart was pounding like a drum. Everything went quiet. I'd muted the TV 
and it was almost like who blinks first scenario, because whoever or whatever it was, was making no noise. An eternity had passed in a series of seconds to minutes, until reality came back with the sound of a doorknob. I heard it jiggling. From deafening silence to hearing the unexpected sound of the figurative pin dropping, my stress response chose correctly for the first time, and I ran. I grabbed my phone, left everything else, and I went right out of the door. I didn't stop until I reached the other side of town. There I remember laying underneath a streetlight, thinking that this was it, the day it was all building up to. I'd been sleeping with a knife under my pillow, being unbelieved for years at this point, and it all led to this. It was either an attempt, or he wasn't done with me yet. He could be coming at any moment, or at his very next opportunity. I took those seconds to try to gather my thoughts, catch my breath, and then I called my mom. She was out at the bar with her boyfriend at the time, so they picked me up and we went back home. Her boyfriend made us stay in the car, and the only thing different than how we left it was that the back door was wide open. It was a complicated antique door, and not easily opened when it wasn't locked, so that should have been a huge worry in itself. But of course, they dismissed that too. They said it must have been the cat. Seriously. The most concerning thing for me, though, was that nothing was taken. Most people would naturally first assume it must have been a burglar. But no, nothing was taken. And at that time, it was just a basement full of expensive tools and equipment, as my mother and her boyfriend would flip houses. And yet not a single one of them was gone. There was more than enough time, too. From my leaving the house to coming back, it had to be 30 minutes or so. Some time after that event, my neighbor then experienced something too. While sitting on his patio with his girlfriend, a man all in black started approaching them from a yard of an abandoned house. My neighbor told him to stop, and he didn't. Then he pulled out his gun, said to stop, and still he didn't. So my neighbor then fired at the ground, and in that moment, he must have decided he wasn't worth it, because he ran off tripping over a branch on his way out. That was around the time he stopped coming around. But now as I previously mentioned, therapy has forced me to face this and try to process it. During the time of these events, naturally, I spent so much time wondering who it could be and why. What were their intentions? Was it to kidnap me? Kill me? Do something unspeakable? But I never got any answers from the world, time, or myself, until possibly now. My brother's friend, after all these events transpired, and while he was sleeping in my brother's car, did something horrifying. He set himself up a long levee, at first just himself in a notebook, and would watch people as they walked by. They went along with their day, unsuspecting, as he would make a record of everyone he saw, hair color, what they were wearing, race, gender, age range, how long they were there, how often, with someone or alone. And then one day, with a knife in hand, he pulled a woman off the levee and into a nearby wooded area. She was able to fight him off. She got away, but not unscathed. He slashed her arm, and I can't even imagine the horror she went through in those moments. Following that, I'm not sure how they found him, or how they knew about the notebook, but the only known address they had for him was my brother's and ours. State and local police, as well as I believe possibly a US Marshal, came to my door in a sudden swarm. They banged on my door, and as I opened, a cop slammed me against the door with his forearm and told me to stay back. I was absolutely clueless to what was happening, but it started to click when I saw my brother's friend being walked out in handcuffs from my brother's home. They set him upon the stairs, feet away from police canines. I could hear them asking where his backpack is. A man said, If you don't tell us where it is, we're gonna search both of these houses. I think he sincerely cared about my brother, as my brother did for him all those years, and so I assumed that's why he divulged that it was under the dining room table at my brother's home. 
They then went in, collected it, and simply left. I don't know what happened to him, but now years later, I wonder if everything that happened to me was because of him. The way he wrote down those people's every movements terrifies me, yet almost solidifies, in a way, my suspicion. What if the only reason he knew when I was truly home alone, or routines, was because he has a notebook on me as well? Six years ago this fall, my sister and I were living with our grandparents. I just started seeing my now wife and she spent a lot of the time at the house with me too. So, we were three young, attractive women, all congregating in one place on a regular basis. We attracted some attention. My grandparents' house is in a small midwestern town. It's located in a quiet neighborhood, about a block off of a country highway. It has a long driveway, a big open lot on one side, and had a tree line on the other. It also has a really big backyard that connects with several other backyards in the neighborhood. The first time I saw the man, my wife and I had been out gravel traveling and talking about everything under the sun. She was planning to go home that night, so she parked across the street from my grandparents' house so that we could finish our conversation before she dropped me off. I suddenly felt this feeling like I was being watched. I thought I was just being paranoid because we'd been talking about creepy things so I shrugged it off. Right before I got out of the car, I noticed the silhouette of a man standing in the tree line on the side of my grandparents' house. It was right around dusk, so I couldn't see him well enough to get a description of him, but I could tell he was there. I told my now wife, and she told me not to get out. We sat there for a while, watching, but the man didn't move. After what felt like a really long time, I told her I was going to make a run for it. I could see my grandpa sitting in his chair by the kitchen window, so I was sure I'd be fine. I took a deep breath, jumped out of the car and sprinted. I turned and locked the door as soon as I stepped in the front door, and grandpa could tell I was spooked. I told him what I had seen, and I thought we should call the cops. He told me that my friend Kenny had been over while I was out. He was drunk and he was probably taking a piss in the trees before he walked through the backyard home. I still felt shaken, but that reassured me a bit. Fast forward, it's been about three days. My sister was at her boyfriend's, my love was at her place, and it's about one in the morning, so my grandparents were asleep. I was up reading articles on my laptop and decided it was time to go to bed. There was a big, beautiful picture window in the living room that overlooks the driveway. It only has small lace curtains that are completely sheer. I stood up to cross the living room and saw something. I jumped back. I peered around the window frame for a closer look. There was a silhouette of a man standing at the end of my driveway. He was tall, well built, wearing a baseball cap, and seemed like he was looking right into the big window. I started to panic. My chair was visible from the window. How long had he been watching me? I ran to check that the garage door and front door were locked, and I ran down the hallway to knock on my grandparents' door. I heard my grandma say, Come in. I told her what I saw, and she woke up my grandpa. He walked out to the living room with me, but there was no one there. My grandparents were popular in the community because they were landlords, and they helped people that were down on their luck. He told me that it might have been Judd one of their renters who borrowed a truck from them a couple of months back. He said I should go to bed and not worry about it. I went to bed feeling really uneasy, but trying hard to convince myself that my grandpa was right. I mean, the silhouette I saw would kind of fit for Judd. The next sighting was the very next night. My love was still at her place. My sister and grandparents were in bed. I was sitting in my chair reading creepy Reddit stories. All of a sudden, I heard movement in the garage. The garage is connected to the house and shares a wall with the living room. I tried to convince myself that I was hearing things. I was paranoid, or maybe it was an animal. Then, I heard movement again and a faint cough. I bolted up from the chair, checked the garage door lock, 
and ran screaming for my grandpa. He jumped up from bed, grabbed his gun and went to check it out. There was no one there. Nothing appeared to have been disturbed. Grandpa sternly told me I needed to start going to bed at night instead of staying up and reading scary stories. He did lock the doors from the garage to the outside though. I went to bed, firmly convinced that there'd been someone in the garage. The next morning, I went to the basement to get my sister up. I asked her if she'd noticed anything weird at the house the last few days. She told me she thought she heard some weird noises outside of a window a couple of nights before and that her dog had growled. Her dog never growled. She explained it to me and she was scared. But we lived in such a small, sleepy, midwestern town. Bad things don't happen here. So, she tried to convince herself that her dog was overreacting to something. Probably a squirrel. I told her about the last four days and she was shocked. We told grandma and grandpa, but they were convinced that it was a coincidence. Grandpa had checked himself twice after all. My sister and I agreed we would keep watch for any weird things. Three more nights later, my wife came to stay with me. I had told her about the incidents that were happening with me and my sister, but she, like our grandparents thought, they were a coincidence. She even told me we were being dramatic. I laughed it off and we continued with our plans for the night, dinner, gravel traveling, and reading in bed before we fell asleep. My wife liked to sleep on the side of the bed next to the window in my room. She would always crack the window just a bit so she could feel the breeze come in from the backyard. It had rained earlier in the day and we had some really great breeze rolling through that night. Before we went to bed, she walked to the window to crack it and I begged her not to. She and I went back and forth about it for a little while and eventually she relented and agreed to turn the fan on instead. We settled into bed so that I could read her some articles, and I fell asleep shortly after. The next thing I remember is hearing my wife yell at me to wake up. Now. After I fell asleep, my wife took the opportunity to crack the window anyway. Once she fell asleep, she found herself waking up for no discernible reason. She decided that she must have to use the bathroom and walked down the hallway. Upon returning to the bedroom, she saw a shadow move outside the bedroom window through the curtain. She stood stock still for a moment, paralyzed, and it didn't move. So she crawled back into bed. She leaned in and kissed my cheek before turning to the window, where she saw a man staring directly at her through the open part of the window. He was tall, well-built, and wearing a baseball cap. She jumped up immediately to slam the window shut and started yelling at me to get up. Suddenly, my sister burst into my bedroom. Diesel was yelling at the window again. I heard footsteps. What did you see? My sister said. We sat up together for a while, making plans to tell our grandma and grandpa in the morning, before we went back to bed in the early hours in the morning. When we woke up, we told my grandpa what happened. When he looked around the house, he found footsteps leading to both of our windows in the backyard. He freaked out and told my grandma and said he was calling the police. My grandma told him not to bother because none of us had a detailed description so the police wouldn't be able to do anything. He was probably just a peeping Tom anyway, which was harmless. She had a peeping Tom as a little girl. We should just make sure that we're not naked or otherwise indecent in front of any windows with open curtains. They argued for a bit and grandpa finally agreed with grandma. He told the three of us girls, though, that we're not to leave the house for any reason after dark. He'd wait up until each of us got there if we were working late. Life went on. There wasn't any more activity, and we figured whoever had been watching us had moved on. We were still following Grandpa's instructions, but as young 20-somethings, it started to feel less urgent as the days went on without any happenings. We were feeling secure and safe. We weren't. Ten days after my wife saw the man peeking in through the window, my sister and I were up late doing college homework together. We each had assignments due online at midnight, and we were scrambling to finish them. I submitted mine at 11.50, my sister a few minutes later, and we decided we were hungry. We didn't have any junk food in the house, so we decided to go to McDonald's. We got the dog, 
got in the car, blared our music, and left. We were having a good time driving through the town, listening to our pumped up music and stuffing our faces, but we knew we needed to get home for class in the morning. So, instead of driving around to finish our music, we decided to go directly home and pull into the driveway while our song was finishing up. We were gone for a total of 20 minutes and we sat in the driveway for about three. We got out of the car to come up the driveway, no care in the world besides getting to bed, and we start walking leisurely, joking and singing. Suddenly I heard a crunching noise, like someone stepping on a leaf. Diesel suddenly jumped behind us and started snarling. I remember hearing my sister say, run, as we started sprinting up the driveway. We could hear the footsteps of someone running behind us, and I just knew it was that guy that had been watching us. I knew that he was going to catch us and hurt us, and all because we'd been so careless to leave the house so late at night for a burger. We got almost on the landing of the stairs, and my sister shouted the dog's name. He came running up and ran into the house right behind us, where we promptly locked the door. We never looked back to see who was chasing us, but we both agreed it must be the man who'd been watching us. We started trying to catch our breath. Diesel was not trying to catch his breath though. He kept running to the living room window, watching and growling. Then he just ran to us and look, just for a second, like he was making sure we were okay. Then he'd run back to the living room window and growl again. As soon as she caught her breath, my sister went to wake my grandpa. The dog stopped growling. We called the police and told them what happened, and they agreed to patrol the area. They never did find him, but we never saw or heard from him again. It still makes my skin crawl to think of what would have happened to my sister and I if her dog hadn't rushed to our protection, or what would have happened to my wife and I if she hadn't noticed him peeking under the open window. I'm just happy that we're all unheard. I gotta get this off my chest. For context, it was probably after 2am. I was in a WhatsApp call with my girlfriend and we were talking normally. Soon her voice cut off from the call and I started hearing a child, I assume a little boy. He was talking, but more like babbling like babies do. My girlfriend has a younger brother and he's 13, so it couldn't have been him. She didn't have any family in a room with her. This was quite odd because it sounded like whatever it was, it was pretty close to the mic. I said, Jess, who is that? Jess. Then as suddenly as it started, it ended, and an eerie silence took over the call. Jess, I asked again. What? She responded. Are you alone? I asked. Yeah, why? She said. I just told her, nothing, I'm just curious. I left it at that. A couple of months passed and the strange interference happened again. I'm sure it happened after 12 a.m. This time the call with my girlfriend got interrupted and a really staticky conversation between two ladies came through. It was too staticky. I could just make out a couple of words. I said, excuse me, at least five times and hello. I got no response or reaction. When silence filled the call once more, I called out for my girlfriend and asked her, Did you hear that? No. What did you hear? I told her what I heard and she just stayed silent. I calmed her down a bit by saying, Maybe someone tapped into our call or my phone intercepted another one. I'm not sure what it was. Trying to reason it made me more uneasy. Thinking about a thing tapping onto our call was creepy. Imagining that it was a creep hacking my cell phone connection actually was worse. Some months after, it happened again. This time, it was worse. It was during the early hours of the morning. The call got interrupted, and I heard on the other end this chilling, high-pitched, fast laughter. It slowed down and lowered the pitch until it was the deepest laugh I've ever heard. It shook me to my core. The laughter stopped and it started crying hysterically, and after a few seconds of wailing, it stopped. 
I immediately told my girlfriend, and she got really scared this time. I told her to forget about it and go to bed. I never forgot about these three incidents. It still freaks me out. I fear calling my girlfriend because of the interferences. If someone can explain this or has had similar experiences, please share. I was on a plane once and noticed that, although people were still boarding, there was a large number of seats around me unoccupied. The last people on though were all together and consisted of one large family traveling together. There were four adults and about ten children, ranging from toddler age to high school to young adult. They had the usual look of a large group traveling with children, some of whom were shy and withdrawn. Others who were running around and the adults looking frazzled, trying to keep everyone and everything together. When they'd all been seated, there seemed to be some issue with seating, as one member of their party was supposed to sit several rows back. The flight attendant apologized and said it happens that sometimes their computer will shuffle sequential seating, that kind of thing, but they assured them that seating was available for everyone. The family sat down, minus one and started with the usual, that's a shame, they wish they could sit up there, talk. Since it seemed that their party was surrounding me, I stopped the flight attendant and asked if I could switch seats with another passenger. This caught the attention of the large group, perhaps anticipating a complaint, but the flight attendant told me no, they don't usually do that, that everyone has to be seated, but they did ask if there was a problem with where I was sitting. I explained to her that I was traveling solo and did not care where I sat. I asked if I could give my seat to the member of the family who was absent, as my seat would have put them in the midst of their group. The family overheard and was thanking me. As I retrieved my bag overhead and followed the flight attendant to the family member's seat, she explained what was happening. I noticed that the family member was a young girl, maybe 12 years old and seemed in a hurry to get back to her family. She thanked me four times. She practically ran up the aisle, and before I could sit down, the man who'd been sitting next to her was literally staring with his mouth open, and asked, What's the problem? No, that girl was sitting here first. That was red flag number one. The flight attendant asked him what was happening, and he immediately looked at me and said, No, I don't want to sit next to him. Where's that girl going? She explained to him that there was no issue and there was nothing she could do now. I think she got the same vibe from him that I did. Now, I want to assure everyone I'm not in the habit of judging people by their appearance, but this guy was the definition of red flags. He was overweight and paunchy, half bald with a few strands combed over, thick glasses and no chin. He was a mouth breather and kept his mouth open constantly drooling on himself, then sucking it back in between heavy breathing. If there were a textbook example of a creep, it would be him. As I was putting my bag overhead, he started talking to himself, under his breath about how this was bullshit. He said, just my luck. I wasn't bothering anybody. Why did they have to move that girl? I wanted to say something to him, but I didn't. It wasn't long before my neighbor got a call and was talking about an upcoming court appearance and I overheard. No victim's testimony. Rarely show up. And people wouldn't ask me to babysit if I was like that. The only time I almost said anything to him was when he started blatantly watching inappropriate stuff on his laptop with his earphones in. Grunting, sweating, wheezing, and he kept repeating, bitch. When a part was on, he evidently liked. Then, he took a blanket and covers his lap. When it became apparent where his hands were going, I pretended to reach for the call button. He then pulled his hands from under the blanket and started muttering under his breath about me minding my own business. At some point I got up to use the restroom and when I returned, he was on the phone again. I caught something about, no, switch seats on me, got away, and he shut up as soon as he saw me. The creep eventually went to sleep and fortunately stayed asleep for the rest of the flight. When we were all deboarding, 
a woman, who I presumed was the mother, was standing with the girl and said, thank you again. I shuddered to think how he acted in the short time she was next to him, or how he would have acted had she remained there. Shocking absolutely no one, and that includes himself, he was met at the gate by security and police, and as he was being led away, he said, this isn't my laptop by the way. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that one. Do me a favor and like the video and drop a comment. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification button to always stay up to date with my latest videos. And I want to give a shout out to my patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. So a huge thanks to Absinthe Alice, Art and Gaming, Sarah P, Rochelle, Christopher, Pretty Girl 215, Christy, Crafty Kel, Kay, Something Edgy, Borderline Betty, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Lady Drackard, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Casey Lewis, Sarah T, Linda, Austin, Tegan, Chris and Donna, Erin, Jennifer, Gabrielle, Misanthropia, Ryan, Astara Rain, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Fire 05, Jody, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelais, and Alex. If you want to check out the perks of my Patreon channel memberships, or you want to submit a story, all my links and social media can be found in the description below. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you all in the next one.